and have a moment of silence. Sorry. <laughs> Todd jumped everything. Todd jumped the prayer, the moment of silence. Okay, so please join us in a moment of silence. You could if you know. Please join us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Ma Madam Chair, I move to approve the agenda with two changes. Okay. One is to move 9.5 immediately following public comment. Nine. Okay. And then two is for 9.4 to be approved as a consent agenda item. Okay, so we have a motion from Mr. Guerra to move 9.5 to immediately following public comment and to be in 9.4 to be included as a consent agenda item when we approve the agenda. Do I have second. a second? I have a question. I have a motion. Okay. What is 9.4? 9.4 uh, is the bond resolution. For which for what issue? Um, so, no, this is this question. is just for uh, to, to fund to fund ongoing operations. Yes, okay. the one we do every year. All right. okay. I, will, I also I, want to change one item. Also, I will hold on, Michael. Mr. Miller had a question. Madam Chair, with nine point four, Todd, did we vote on that in the committee of a whole, and was it voted? Was it a unanimous vote? Yes, it was unanimous. Okay. So is this an oversight on the? on the agenda more so than anything. Yeah, Actually, we have a policy that says no matter what, if it's yeah, not in finance, if it comes from audit finance, it's got to come, come through us. Right. No, 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 no. That's not my question. My we have question. a policy that No, no, no. That wasn't the question. Was, it was. Okay. It is. All right. Okay. So. Um, Even if it's unanimous, it still has to be on the okay. regular agenda. So who made the second? I did. Okay. So um, we have a motion and a second from or, Reverend Collins. Yes. I also want to amend the agenda on the, on the, on the 9.5 on the business and change that to information or update for the CS. Okay. So Reverend Collins um, has, wants to move 9.5 to information only. Do we have a second on that item? I have a second and a question. Okay. You have a second. Mr. Miller has a second in the question. Okay. Question number one is, Todd, you just asked to have that moved directly under um, public comment. And Cindy, Chris, and Kevin were at the committee. So, is Reverend Collins's motion to have it be information? Is that what the committee at the meeting? Is that what you guys decided, or no? There was no no general agreement on anything at the meeting. Priscilla was there. She's trying to tell you. Wait, 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 wait. The, the, the committee gave. Uh, Okay, hold so Let me ask another question then. From that committee meeting, was there a recommendation yes. I'm gonna tell you what made is. to vote for us to vote on this item today? No, it was not. The recommendation was that the committee will meet again a week later for a final meeting and then come back with recommendations to decide where to build the CS. That's what the entire committee agreed to. Okay, but just point, yeah, point of order, though, we've got a, right. okay, a motion in a second. Right. And we have, and I have it recorded also. Right, but just to be clear, it was on the agenda. <laughs> What the, my action we took in September was for it to be on the agenda. So we have a agenda, yeah. right. So we have a motion from Reverend Collins to make that item information only. Okay. So we're going to vote on that, and then we'll vote on Todd's um, item. So Cindy, to make so what? What are we? The only <laughs> motion before us is to change 9.5 to, to information. information only. No. Okay. No. Okay, Reverend Collins. Okay, that, I do have to say that. The committee, the entire committee voted. Cindy was present, and no one objected. They had the option to vote that night, or send a new meeting, and Cindy and Priscilla both were there in the meeting. And the whole committee said we want to meet again and make a final decision. Okay. So I'm voting. I, I vote yes to make an information. Okay. Ms. Jeffrey, no. Mr. Miller, yes. Mr. Stobbs, no. Reverend Mack. So help me to understand. I, I need to be clear. We. We appointed three. Where's Kevin? Where's Kevin? Yeah. Go ahead. Ask question. Kevin. Yeah. We appointed three committee members, North Charleston representatives, to go out, have a special meeting, come back, and give a recommendation to the board. Is that correct? That is correct. The committee. The input to the board. Yes. Right. The committee met. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
the three North Charleston along with their selected members. Uh -huh. Reverend Collins is saying that the committee recommend that I need to come they back to Ms. Again. They meet again. Yeah, yeah, the, following, the following week is, Priscilla's not a part of the committee, but Kevin is. And you can witness the same thing. Hold on, hold on. And we're midway through a vote. Right, we're midway through a vote. Let's it was a dishonest vote. Question. So, Kevin was there, Cindy was there, mm -hmm. and Chris was there, yeah, Reverend Chris Collins. There. Yeah. And Priscilla. But those three are, are, the, are the members. Right. So, what did you guys decide? Because that's, that's, that's where... Everything okay. lies. We, we decided to be the whole crew. It was about 40 people. No, no, I don't want to hear about the crew. No. I don't hear about the committee. We decided to be another meeting. Have another meeting. That's going to give me the recommendation to be another meeting. So the three of you decided. Yes, and no one opposed to it. Cindy was right next to me. Mm -hmm. She didn't oppose at all. And I got it recorded. All right. So how do you vote on making this just informational? That's all you're voting on. I, I understand that, but but tonight is for action. So we're, we're talking about making a decision tonight. But we also talked about the committee bringing a recommendation back to the board. Right, so right. we also at the September meeting said it would be on the October board meeting for a fraction. That was our plan. But Jeff, Jeff said as long as we do it by in November, we're good to go. That's what we're trying I, I thought he time said to October. That's why I thought. He said October. October. He said October. He said October. He said, he said October. November. 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 I, I think I mean, in November. Stop. Right, hold on, everybody. Reverend Mack has a question. So in October, we voted to make this an action item tonight. In September, we voted to make an action item. Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. And how do you vote? Yes. Okay. We're, uh, Mr. Alonche, we're voting. So you want it to be action or you want it to be information? Information. Wait. You, according to the chair, she said that a motion was made by the right. board that this item be placed on the agenda tonight right. so for you, an action. So Is that correct? No. Yes. And then you would vote no. no on the yeah. The, mo the motion. No, so he he voted the right way because the committee said you'll you vote again. We make it information only. If you vote no, we may keep it as action, which we, you know, may or may not. For point order, man, can you start with the one? Please start with I don't know. I don't, because I, yeah, everything is being recorded, and I don't want to look like I'm stupid here. So, <laughs> so let's, let's just be, everybody else already voted, so let's just be clear because we went into a discussion. Uh, so the motion exactly was? The motion is to make item 9.5 information only. Okay, so right. based on the fact that it was already voted to place on the agenda tonight for an action item, then it will remain as such. So you want to vote yes or no? You have to cast a vote for the motion to change Hang it. So Hang on, no. No, okay. All right, um, Mr. Holland, Jay, we're, we're voting on whether to change item 9.5 from action to information. So I just need a yes or no. I'm voting for, for information only. Information only, okay. So... And I vote no, so the motion fails. So the next motion Ms. was. Ms. Darby, to before you go to this one point of order, when we had the uh, meeting in September about coming back for this meeting and today, and then your, your statement was that at the committee, you guys can discuss what you want to discuss. And we met at North Charleston City Hall up on the third floor, and Sydney, myself, and Kevin, with the host of people, right. they all agreed that, they can, that and we talked to Jeff. Well, we'll talk, we, we can talk about that when we get to that agenda item, and, and Jeff agreed that as long as we had it situated by no, in November, by November, that we give him time to get the building completed on time. This is what we discussed at, at, this, at the CS meeting at North Charleston. And Sydney was there present and recorded. And for, well, hold on, please, I'm almost done. But for her to sit here now and be dishonest in front of the entire school okay. board and all the, the next public item is, item is not is not is not right. That doesn't say well at all. That's, that's just dishonest. Reverend Collins, I have nine point five to immediately follow a public comment and to approve nine point four when we approve the agenda. As yeah, but but I don't want you to cover up the reputation, Miss Garvey, by rushing through it. Talk about this it. is dishonest business for representatives. It's dishonest. This is not uh, for it. Is. Order, you shouldn't be saying that on But the it is dishonest. It's recorded. It's under recorded. That's in front of against our code of ethics to do that. No, that's, yes, it is. That's a, a violation of code of ethics. The lies of people publicly. The lie. No, nope. you don't lie to public publicly. I'm not. You can talk about when we get to that agenda item, Reverend. Mr. This is the process that started with the 20, in 2014 with that, the approval of the CAS to be added to the 2015 referendum. So, okay. I mean, this is not something that's we're been... We're voting on Todd's motion, Mr. Hollinshed. So we're moving... Like we're, we're, body, we're voting on moving 9.5 to immediately Ooh. following... It's 9.5 to immediately following public comment okay. and then to approve 9.4... 
as a consent agenda item because it was a unanimous vote at the Committee of the Whole. So how do you vote, mm -hmm. Mr. Allingshed? Yes. Ms. Coates? Yes. Mr. Garrett? Yes. Reverend Collins? Yes. Ms. Jeffrey? Yes. Mr. Miller? Aye. Mr. Straub? Yes. Reverend Mack? Yes. And I vote yes. The motion passes. Okay, the next item on the agenda is approval of minutes. We have approval of minutes from... Madam um, Chair? Yes. On the September 25th board meeting, my motion was recorded incorrectly in the minutes and we need to have it corrected. We've had the video reviewed. It's also published on the website. But my motion was to build CAS for the North area that was approved on the 2014 ballot <coughs> referendum at the North Charleston High School site. That's verbatim off of the tape and I'd like the minutes to reflect, reflect that. that. Okay, so is that a part of a motion to approve those minutes? Yes. Okay, so Cindy's made a motion to approve the September 25th minutes with that correction. Um, and do I have a second? Uh, I mean, yeah. Okay, so um, Portia, you got that? Yes. Okay, so we have a motion and a second to approve the September 25th minutes with um, the correction. And I watched the videotape, and that is Cindy's, I mean, that's right. Okay, so um, so September 25th minutes. Mr. Collins said? All right. Ms. Coates? Yes. Mr. Garrett? Yes. Reverend Collins? Stay. Okay. Ms. Jeffrey? Yes. Mr. Miller? Aye. Mr. Straub? Yes. Reverend Mack? Yes. And I vote yes, the motion passes. Do I have a motion to approve? I make a motion to approve the minutes from the special called meeting of October 3rd and the special called meeting of October 9th. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, Mr. Hollinshed? All right. Ms. Coates? Yes. Mr. Garrett? Yes. Reverend Collins? Yes. Ms. Jeffrey? Yes. Mr. Miller? Aye. Mr. Staub? Yes. Reverend Mack? Yes. And I vote yes, the motion passes. The next item on the agenda, um, we have a couple of executive session items. The first one is- I'm On the decision regarding the appeal, I move to approve the recommendation to overturn the D-10 decision and the staff's recommended course of action with that. A second. A second. Can you, and can you add that we ask to have an update at the end of the semester? And that we have an update at the end of the semester. I okay. second it. Uh, can, we, can we clarify the motion uh, yeah. a little bit? Okay. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. I want to clarify the motion. So okay, the motion, the um, administration of the school appealed a decision. Right, I know I'm that. moving to overturn the decision. So to uphold their, to grant their appeal. The recommendation, right? Yeah. The staff's yeah. The, so, so, so according to what I'm saying, staff recommended the student were able to remain at Daniel Jenkins and, and attend the afternoon. E afternoon program. Yes. yes. So not really overturning it and right. receive additional resources right. Correct. in the evening program. Right. right. The so motion. That's, so that's what that's what yes, motion Yes, that is, that is so it. Yes, yeah, that was the reason. Yeah, I just didn't know to what level we could go into that. Chair, yep. to clarify, the request before us was to, um, the question before us was to overturn the decision, so that has to be part of the motion if that's so what we're going to do. Overturning the D, D, D right. 10, 10 yes. Board's decision, so yes. So it ha that has to be part of the motion. Okay. So, Todd, can you? I, I said I moved to overturn the D10 decision and. Okay. And uh, implement the staff, the school staff recommendation. Yes. Okay. Yep, Michael. Todd, in your motion, you mentioned um, getting information at the end, but you did not identify a sunset for which the That's student nice. may be able to go back. Right. So do you want to add that in the motion? Miller, make a friendly amendment that it's until One's the semester. end of the semester. Typically at this school though, doesn't staff come forward with, do, they don't know. they have a process for yeah. going through that? Yeah. Oh. It doesn't okay. work, it doesn't work. Okay. We do have a process for that. And I think we discussed having an update at the end of the semester. And then if we want to take other action. We Madam can. Chair, I'd like to ask for a friendly amendment to that motion that, that we overturn the decision, place the student in the afternoon classes for the remainder of the first semester. Furthermore, I'd like to ask that the board receive the educational delivery and other questions as asked in the, most, in the next recent update. I'll second that. All right, so we have a motion and a second. Is that all good with you, Todd? That's fine with me, okay, yeah. Okay, great. Portia, right. do you have all that? I have uh, Place the 
-hmm. place a student until the end of until the semester, semester. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and the board receives the update as soon as possible. Okay. All right, Mr. Hollingshed. Excuse me. So Todd's motion died. No, Todd, no, they added the Todd's okay. motion. So. Yeah. Yes. Okay, yes. Uh, Ms. Code? Yes. Mr. Barrett? Yes. Reverend Collins? Yes. Ms. Jeffrey? Yes. Mr. Miller? Aye. Mr. Stobbs? Yes. Reverend Mack? Yes. And I vote yes. The motion passes. Um, the, the next item is item 5.1A2, a homeschool application. I have a motion to approve. Move to approve the application. Second. Second. All right. Do you have any questions? All right, this is for the homes to approve the homeschool application, uh -huh. Mr. Hollinshed? Yes. Ms. Coates? Yes. Mr. Garrett? Yes. Reverend Collins? Yes. Ms. Jeffrey? Yes. Mr. Miller? Aye. Mr. Staub? Yes. Reverend Mack? Yes. And I vote yes. Um, we're not going to take any action on item 5.1B. Um, then we have a couple. But what we are asking for any comments on that to come back at the next meeting, correct? Yeah. Well, actually, to come back before that. Well, by November 1st. By November 1st. Right. So if right. anybody has any changes, suggestions to come to send to me by November 1st, we'll compile and send back out to you guys, and then we'll take action at the committee hall. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Todd. Um, the next. Item is um, we have two items. We have a D, the D four contractual matter. Do we have a motion? I move to approve. Okay, move to approve, which was directing staff to negotiate an offer to purchase 37 plus or minus acres in North Charleston for a price not to exceed, and using scenario number three as the basis for negotiation. I, so, want, to, I want to amend his motion. Yes. Okay. That uh. But they also consider other, other options uh, before finalizing the deal. Okay, so, so what was the motion? So, uh, it's Todd's it, motion was to move to approve the. Don't say the amount. Okay, all right. Yeah. <laughs> right. It is. You're right. You're right. It's not Sorry. for public consent. Okay, so until it's okay. until it's until it's, it's finalized. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. All right. So, what exactly is the wording of the motion on the floor? Correct staff. Do you mind doing that? Uh, move to approve staff. Uh, May I? He, sure. <laughs> <laughs> How about we do it this way? Land, yeah. um, because what we're doing is actually authorizing them to enter into a negotiation. We move to authorize the district to enter into negotiations to purchase the properties listed under the item for D4 contractual matter and D2 contractual matter as proposed. D4. Let's, yes. Can we just do them separately? Just D4, not D2. Sure. D4. So yeah, D4. Then, so then we can do them separately, but the move to authorize the district to enter into negotiations to purchase properties uh, described in the D4 contractual matter. Okay, so now that's our motion. And that covers the right. thing that he and wanted. So do we have a second? Second. Okay. Um, any questions about that? All right, Mr. Hollingshed? All right. Ms. Coates? Yes. Mr. Garrett? Yes. Reverend Collins? Yes. Ms. Jeffrey? Yes. Mr. Miller? Aye. Mr. Staubs? Yes. Reverend Mack? Yes. And I vote yes. That motion passes. Do I have a motion? I move to approve the D2 bus lot recommendation. Staff, to approve staff to negotiate for the D2 bus lot. Second. All right, so we have a motion and a second. Any questions on that? Okay, we're at Mr. Hollinshed. One more favor for Mount Pleasant. Oh, uh, hey, I just hey, we just gave you one. All right, you didn't give us none. That's okay. that's five to one. Sent Miss Coates. Yes. Mr. Garrett. Yes. Reverend Collins. No. Huh? Okay. <laughs> Miss Jeffrey. Yes. Mr. Miller. Aye. Uh, Mr. Stobbs. No, and I will repeat what Miss Jeffrey just said. We are one county, and I vote yes. Thank you, Reverend Mack. Yes. And I vote yes, so that motion passes. Thanks, everybody, on that. Um, the next item is item D, student transfers. Um, at uh, the last executive session, the motion was for us to overturn the constituent board's decision for item for student number 119 and 121 and uphold the I move to approve D1 and D2. Okay. Do I have a second? This is the Madam Chair, I'd like to pull the votes apart. Yes, because I Okay, have, uh, I move to approve D1. 
Okay, so item D1, which is student transfers, overturning, it's right in front of you guys. So, uh, you have any questions about that? We discussed this at the need a second. October con uh, Committee of the Whole meeting. Uh -huh. We need okay. a second. Second. We need a second. Wow. Reverend Mack seconded. Mr. Holland shed. All right. Ms. Coates? No. Um, Mr. Garrett? Yes. Uh, Reverend Collins? This is the one with the, this is the one involved in the form. The, uh, Trans, these are transfers. This is just transfers. Yes. Okay. You agreed when we did the Yes. Yes. Ms. Jeffrey? Yes. Mr. Miller? Aye. Uh, Mr. Straub? Yes. Reverend Mack? Yes. And I vote yes. The motion passes. And the next item? I move to approve D2. Okay. So we have a motion for, um, this was the <sighs> appeal of... The student yeah. placement, keeping right. them at the school until the end of the year if they do the paperwork. So we have a no, motion. No, that is not what's written. No, and then, right, correct. So, so I just want to make sure. It's for 60 days. Right. It's written there. Right. Okay, sorry, yeah. sorry. Yeah. 60 days, they have to do the paperwork by six days. I apologize. Mm -hmm. So we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Can we, can we read the motion so we make sure it's recorded correctly? Thank you. The it's, board will consider allowing two students to continue at Academic Magnet High right. School at a school yeah. with the understanding that parents must meet property ownership requirements within 60 days or students must return to their home schools at the end of the first semester. 60 days of what? Today? Yes. Yeah, it's to yeah, what what the... we vote. Okay. So, All right. All right. Any questions about that? All right. Mr. Hollingshed? All right. Ms. Coates? No. Mr. Garrett? Yes. Reverend Collins? I just want to ask you, well, the, 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 the vote was the original vote, it was off of the ninth, right? So we vote, we did it at the committee exactly of the right. whole. Yeah, no, we, we didn't, didn't, no, we didn't, didn't do it. Yet. We didn't do it at a board meeting. Yeah, so we didn't have a special this is call the first, This is the first board so meeting. So was the date going to be the ninth or the 23rd? No, it would be Today. 23rd. Today. Today. All right. All right. Reverend Collins? No. Okay. Ms. Jeffrey? Yes. Mr. Miller? Nope. Mr. Stobbs? Yes. Reverend Mack? Yes. And I vote yes. And the motion passes. Sorry. Um, special recognitions on the next item on the agenda. And again, thanks everybody for being patient. <clears throat> Good evening, Chair Darby, Vice Chair Mack, Board Members, Dr. Postelweight. We have two very special recognition, very special, special recognitions this special, evening. Special. And I'd like to ask Ms. Rachel Stanley, who's the Youth Market Director, as well as Keith Cummings, the Vice President for the American Heart Association, to come forward. So uh, I'd like to say uh, thank you to Dr. Postlewaite and the uh, board for allowing us to come this evening. Uh, we work for the American Heart Association. We do uh, educational programs in school that are also fundraisers for life-saving research. And the support that this county shows us is incredible. There are 20 schools that are participating with us with programs that we do to teach uh, five basic messages. And we try to repeat those as often as possible throughout the years to help with the education of students. Also, some funds are raised to, uh, as I mentioned, uh, do some research. Basically, children learning heart healthy uh, ways is one benefit that they get. Uh, second is get learning to give back to the community and help others. Um, a third one is that we actually give some of the uh, proceeds back to the schools for PE equipment. So this year, 20 schools uh, that participate got an average of about $285 back to buy PE equipment. So that's sometimes uh, helpful in tight budgets. But it's only 20 schools, so we would love to get this messaging to as many schools as possible, and any help we could get there, we'd appreciate. Um, we also uh, invest in the professional development of, of the PE teachers uh, by giving uh, memberships to their professional organization. Uh, the state one's called SCAFERD, and the national one's called SHAPE. Uh, but tonight what we want to do is just highlight a few, few of the students in the school systems that raised the most for us, took our messages to heart, and actually helped us uh, the most. The, uh, the first one, top fund uh, student, is Brielle Johnson. If you could please come up, we'd like to give you an award and also stay, stay up here because we're going to get some pictures. Brielle is at Montessori Community School of Charleston. <laughs> And she was the number one student fundraiser in all of South Carolina. So that's a big. Wow. Riley Hammond, could you please come up? 
she was from Jenny Moore Elementary School and actually was the number five student fundraiser in all of South Carolina. So congratulations. Without our volunteers, the American Heart Association really can't survive. And so these are the schools with vol and the volunteers that did uh, really big things this year. At Bust Academy, uh, Principal uh, Shantae White and Volunteer Coordinator Shannon West were number 18 school in, this, in South Carolina. We'd like to, any representative that is here from the school to come up, please. At Drayton Hall Elementary School, Principal Brian Agnew, uh, there's an assistant principal, Miss Anderson, as well, and the volunteer coordinator was Cynthia Baggett. They were the number seven school in all of South Carolina. Please come up. Uh, St. Andrew's School of Math and Science with the principal of Amy um, uh, Cario and volunteer coordinator Ginny Jones was the number four school in South Carolina. And then finally, uh, with the schools, Jenny Moore Elementary School, let me just tell you a little bit about this. This is Principal Karen Felder, please come up. And I, I know that Jennifer Dawson couldn't be here. She would love to be. They were number nine school nationally. Number one in our affiliate, which includes Maryland, Virginia, South Carolina, and Washington, D.C., and North Carolina. And number one in South Carolina. So I just wanted to point that out. That was very, very impressive. And thank you so much. I'm, I'm sad that Jennifer couldn't be here because I know she'd, she'd enjoy. Well, the support is incredible. So finally, I would just again say, like to thank the county, and I know our top fundraisers would like to present to Dr. Pusselwaite, if you would please come down here. We've got an award for you, because you are the number two school district in South Carolina, with a total of uh, $124,296 that went to life-saving research. Thank you so much, and we really appreciate it. Thank you to all, and Rachel Stanley is next to me as the local director that does, does so much uh, and is always available for help. But if anyone's got a school or knows of a school that isn't participating that would like to, please get in touch with Rachel. Thank you. I'd now like to ask Mr. Ron Cromps, our executive director for facilities, to come forward along with the representative from the United States Environmental Protection Agency, Ms. Katerina Hatcher, who is the Energy Star Public Sector National Manager and also represents our representatives of Synergistic, our energy partner. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, board Chair Darby, board members, Dr. Postaway, thanks very much. Um, excited to talk about our energy program for just a moment and uh, significant noteworthy progress we've been making over the last couple of years. We're excited about these achievements that illustrate our determination to save resources that can be repurposed for the classroom. Uh, we've decreased energy consumption by 5.5% over the last year, computed a little over 3 million and avoided energy costs over the last two years. Uh, this year initiated a program to, uh, to share energy savings with our schools. We're really excited about that. Furthermore, we've uh, surpassed our 20-year goal uh, set in 2000 of a 20% reduction in energy use intensity uh, by 2020, but we've already reached that goal. So uh, we'll continue to drive on to reduce energy consumption. And finally, this year, 58 of our schools have received an Energy Star certification from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. That means that those schools are performing at or better than 75% of the peer group of uh, K-12 uh, schools across the country. And Harborview Elementary School is the 10,000th uh, certified EPA Energy Star school in the country. And so Ms. Hatcher came from D.C to help us celebrate that. But I want to offer a round of applause to my energy team. If you guys would all stand in the back. So well done. And Dr. Postolade, I wonder if you would join us on the floor. Ms. Hatcher is going to make a presentation to us. And Dr. Price. So this is a plaque uh, for the Energy Star certification for our schools.
That concludes tonight's special recognition. Great. Thank you very much, and congratulations to everybody. Um, next on our agenda, a visitor and public comments, Reverend Mack. Okay. We have with us tonight, uh, let me just... Uh, Okay, just a friendly reminder, board meetings uh, shall be conducted in an orderly and efficient manner, and any individual who desires to appear before a regular meeting of the board shall sign in prior to the 515 cutoff time with open session. It'll be allowed a maximum of two minutes to address the board. No speaker may use public comment to discuss personnel matters or matters otherwise private or confidential. Speakers are to discuss issues, not individuals. The chairman or the designee is authorized to terminate any speaker's time who does not observe this policy. And tonight we'll have with us uh, Jesse Williams, uh, if you would come at this time, uh, Luann Rosenwig, if I'm saying that correct, uh, and Amy Howitz and Michael Carpenter in that order. Good evening. Just a second, Jess, we got two people coming out. Okay. There you go. You're good. Hi, good evening. Uh, this, this is concerning the uh, Center for Advanced Studies. Uh, and I know there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of history with this uh, Garrett issue. But honestly, I, um, a couple of us just found out maybe like a year ago, 12 months ago, on what was going on. I know it's, it was up since 2014. But we, a lot of people honestly did not know that, it was, that the Garrett High School was actually coupled with the CAS uh, um, ASP, um, uh, referendum item. So that's very important to understand. And so as we came along, we started uh, wondering what was going on. So that's why we started coming to the board and asking what was going on. And um, we, we really didn't get much information until it started to approach um, the time of actually in March when we, start, when we guys wanted to do the, the summertime meetings, which we did do that. So um, I don't want to rehash too much, but um, so that's kind of what, what happened there. And um, so whenever, the, uh, whenever we met, sort of appreciated by forming that com committee, which is really, really great. And so we met at City Hall, and we got together. One aspect that we talked about was unequivocally, everybody in that room, whether it was a county councilman, whether it was, it was a, a school board member, a citizen, Everybody unequivocally believed that we should keep Garrett open with his trades. That was, that was no doubt about that. So you guys are elected officials, and we ask that we keep Garrett open with the trades. And, um, and unfortunately, the CAS issue is coupled with Garrett because that's how it's been proposed to, to the community from the, from the school district. So that's, that's what I'm asking. We have over 1,900 signatures stating that. And, um, and uh, it seems to me like the best option would be to put it at Garrett because that's, that's how it's going to actually get some, some attention to put it where the trades already are. And, um, and unfortunately, we're faced with that situation. I heard, I'm hearing that there's going to be another high school planned in North Charleston. Why not keep the high schools open that we have now and save the district money? So I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Luann Rosenzweig. I'm with the Charleston Area Justice Ministry. I'm here tonight to talk about PBIS and restorative practices. I'd first like to um, acknowledge Ms. Coker and her staff um, for meeting with Cajun regularly to provide us updates on these two programs. Um, successful imp implementation of PBIS and restorative practice has the ability to transform our schools. 86 schools have implemented PBIS. They are all at different levels of implementation depending on where they started. It's critical that a culture of accountability be developed 
to ensure that schools don't falter on implementation. Everyone must be asking schools how implementation is going, and for those schools that are struggling, it must be made clear how they can get additional help. Five schools are implementing restorative practices. I cannot stress enough the benefit every school has to implement restorative practices. Adults in the five schools that have started are learning how to resolve conflict with one another in healthy ways. We learned this past week that adults who have been through the restorative process have acknowledged that it can be a difficult and sometimes uncomfortable process. But the end result of repairing broken relationships is worth the effort. Both staff and students deserve the opportunity to build relationships and maintain them and to repair them when they have conflicts. Funding must be in place for continued training and the expansion of restorative practices. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Amy Horowitz, and I have a child at the School of the Arts in seventh grade. I'm here to speak in favor of implementing restorative practices at SLA and across the district. Although SLA, although SLA may not have a reputation for discipline problems, conflicts are a part of being human. With whole school <coughs> implementation, everyone is trained and involved, administrators, teachers, cafeteria workers, bus drivers, as well as students. School climate improves. Everyone learns techniques and skills in communication, shared decision making, as well as building, maintaining, and restoring relationships. As the culture shifts and these relationships are established, many problems we've been concerned with, like school fights or uh, fights on buses, misunderstandings and abuses of social media and bullying are reduced and eliminated. Last year I read with concern an article about SLA students who edited a photo from the production of the school musical Grease and included a Nazi flag in the background and then posted the picture on social media where it spread. I read that the principal said restorative practices were used, but I worry that training has not been provided. And if restorative practices are implemented in a lukewarm fashion, I fear that true progress may be undermined. Learning a few techniques Few techniques and using a few catchphrases will not create the school climate that we all want. Indeed, unfortunately, last month there was another incident at SLA. A high school student walked down the breezeway at lunch loudly repeating, kill the Jews. I have no idea what is going on with that young man. Whatever it is, I want restorative practices in place to address it. Every student and every teacher deserves the opportunity to use restorative practices with increased safety for students and teachers, improved relationships, decreases in disruptions, and accompanying increases in <coughs> instructional time and energy. Full implementation of restorative practices can be a powerful force for change in our school and our community. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Micah Blaze Carpenter. I've come here tonight to ask the board to support student learning and growth across CCSC by implementing restorative practices in all of our schools. Um, I've been working as an educator for almost a decade. I've worked as a teacher in Charlotte and in Charleston, and as the director of the Carolina Youth Action Project's Alternative to Incarceration Program. Um, I have witnessed the transformative power of restorative practices, which seek to solve problems and repair relationships rather than simply punishing the wrong, uh, punishing young people in each of these settings. When restorative practices are implemented properly, problem students' behavior often improves, and more successful students gain valuable leadership skills. Today, I'm an English teacher at North Charleston High School. It's a job I love. But like many CCSD schools, it is an urgent need to implement restorative practices. North Charleston has been in the headlines for all the wrong reasons this year. Students, parents, and staff are rightfully concerned about all the conflict we've seen this fall. Um, however, the typical responses to conflict at school, like suspension and arrest, um, have proven ineffective, and I don't believe they'll work. We need instead to implement restorative practices, which allow students, families, and faculty to address the root cause of misbehavior and empower students to correct their own mistakes and grow as people. I believe that's our job as educators. 
I know restorative practices will make our school safer and more joyful because I see that effect in my own classroom where I use restorative practices every day. Students are almost never written up or kicked out of class for breaking the rules and they'll tell you I have a lot of rules. Um, <laughs> but when they enter into conflict either with each other or with me, I give them the tools to talk through it and solve the problem. As a result, students learn more, we're all happier, and importantly, students are at a much lower risk of entering the school to prison pipeline. Because we handle almost everything in-house, I've seen no violence in my classroom this year, and I've only written a handful of office referrals. Compare that to teachers who follow the code of conduct and write 10 or 12 referrals a day. Um, I'd like to see restorative practices in our schools across the district to prevent this. Thanks. Thank you. Next, we have John Hale, Kendall Dees, Pastor Thomas Dixon, and Kristen French. Good evening, my name is John Hale. I'm speaking as co-director of the Quality Education Project, and I'm here to strongly advocate that CAS is built at Garrett High School. First, Garrett High School has been designated for years now as the countywide magnet school to build a trade, I'm sorry, as a countywide trades magnet school. To build CAS at a different high school undermines the mission of the school district to build a quality trades program and it lacks internal consistency. It also shows a lack of investment in a black high school that is relying upon trades. Second, as noted by Reverend Collins, the board agreed in September for an um, advisory board from, built upon community members and based on their decision, the board would take that into consideration. When the board just approved a few minutes ago to make an action motion when the advisory board has yet to complete its deliberation, you have continued to poison the relationship that the board is attempting to build with the community. Third, I'm making a public issue that a board member submitted a proposal after the advisory board meeting last Wednesday by email 24 hours before the board is going to vote in which this proposal states that CAS will be built at Stahl High School. This has not been vetted by the community. This has not been vetted by students, faculty, or community advocates. This is a duplicitous proposal that undermines the democratic process and perpetuates mistrust that the board has built with the, with the community. Finally, let the record show that if this passes tonight, the board has continued to undermine its relationship with the community, specific, specifically with people of color, and let the record show that this proposal before you tonight shows a complete disregard for providing a quality education for students of color in Charleston County. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Dr. Kendall Dees. I'm the co-director of the Quality Education Project. I wanna make a few critical points about the Garrett issue. First and foremost, I'm a strong supporter of Garrett being the location for the Center for Advanced Studies. Very familiar with this model. It's taking place in a number, number of areas around the country and it's a very viable education, educational option. I really feel that in this case, Garrett is the proper location for it. It already has trades that are existing there. And we really need to invest in the school. The school at one point was thriving, and it's been asserted by members of the committee and individuals who came to the last meeting that the district turned its back on Garrett. I don't know what the outcome of this meeting is gonna to be tonight and what the vote will be, but I will say this. I think the crux of the issue here is that I think most of us in this room agree that a CAS or um, Center for Advanced Studies is a good idea, a good plan, a good educational model. And it's going to be built somewhere. We already know that. If we move forward in that direction, it will be at Garrett. It will be at some particular location here. I prefer it being at Garrett because that's a viable option. It will invest in Garrett, which is, which is what is needed. If we decide to go in another direction and have this CAS built at another location, can you guarantee the community here tonight that you will simultaneously invest in Garrett as a school? I'm concerned that given the track record in the past with this district in terms of focusing in on that particular school, that there's reassurance that that's needed that you will actually invest in Garrett while you try to build it in another location. So that's my concern. 
We're going to make a decision tonight. It's going to be in a particular location. Preferably, I'm hoping it will be at Garrett, because that will take care of the issue of investing in Garrett. But if you go in another direction, please guarantee people in this community that you will not turn your back on another black institution, that you will invest in Garrett, that you will invest in the students that are there, that you will broaden the curriculum, and you make it a viable institution for the people who are living in that particular community. Thank you. Thank you. Evening, everyone. Good evening. I was told that uh, yesterday an email was sent out with a completely different proposal than the one that's been discussed um, by the Community Advisory Board. This proposal includes closing Garrett Academy and putting the CAS at stall. Now, last Wednesday, the 18th, five days ago, the Garrett Academy Advisory Board met. And at that meeting of the civilian presence, there was an overwhelming support for putting the CSA, CAS at Garrett and keeping Garrett open. Overwhelming support by the civilian, by the voice of the civilians that were there. But since we were, but, but since we were told at that time, actually, that the deadline was not until November. That was the last time that we could get this done. But because of that, there were people there who said, OK, we need to meet again. So we agreed to meet again. Now let's fast forward to here we are five days later, and the voice of the people that spoke last Wednesday has overall been overridden, negated, disrespected, and told we don't care nothing about the voice of the people because we're going to do what we want to do anyway. Board, that's not right. That is not right. If we are going to, well, I, I attended that meeting. I don't appreciate my time being wasted talking about things and making decisions and coming to agreements that ultimately are going to be overturned by this board. I would hope that this board would take the time to listen to the voice of the people, not only in this case, but as we move forward consistently. And let's not resort to the off-handed, sometimes backdoor dealings that we've seen in governmental agencies and elected officials in the past. It's time for a new day of transparency and accountability, and I definitely expect the best out of this board because this board is comprised of the best that we have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Kristen French. I live in North Charleston. I realized that last month the board decided to give an ad hoc committee time to make a recommendation about where the Center for Advanced Studies should be placed and that you plan to vote on this tonight as to whether to place it at North Charleston High School. I'd encourage you to either vote no or to postpone this vote long enough to receive the recommendation from the committee, which is led by three members of the board. Even though the committee did not vote before today on the recommendation, there is a lot of support for placing the CSA, uh, CAS at Garrett and keeping Garrett open as a school. As others have mentioned, one of the three board members leading that community advisory committee produced a last minute proposal to place the CAS at Stahl High School. This wasn't expected by anyone involved in the process. If this proposal is presented for a vote tonight, she will be undermining the process of the committee and not giving true representation of the committee's leaning on the issue. In fact, until this was emailed out yesterday, every public conversation with board members at community meetings has been met with very strong opinions that the CES will be built to NCHS and no other options need to be considered. There's never been a significant discussion about building it at stall out in the open. So I don't think this should be put to a vote tonight. The reason that citizens have been questioning the decisions about CES and Garrett are precisely because of secretive negotiations that have been sprung on the public with little or no public input. And that is what we are unwilling to accept. You've wasted the last five months when you were supposed to be getting community input on where to put this CAS, and now, at the very last minute, a new proposal. That's not acting as a governing body. We need true leadership for every child in this district. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
This concludes our public comments for tonight. Okay, so thank you. Um, just to, before we go on to item 9.5, just a point of information on a couple of things. Um, Mr. Barrowe did in an update um, some information about the time frame for the CAS. I'm just going to pass that to you guys, take one and pass it down. And I just want to make sure everybody understands, because um, Reverend Matt brought this up. At the uh, September board meeting, Mr. Allen Chad moved second by Reverend Collins to delay the North Charleston CAS vote to allow time to convene an advisory committee to include elected officials of North Charleston the three elected North Charleston board members to discuss the CAS program in North Charleston. The three representatives will submit a recommendation by October 19th. This matter will be placed on the October 23rd board agenda for action. So that's how we got to where we are right now, just to having it on the agenda. And it doesn't say anything about closing Garrett in there. So, all right, so we're on item 9.5. Madam Chair. Yes, Mr. Miller. Was a recommendation <coughs> provided by those three board members? Um, my, understand, uh, all, my understanding from what Reverend Collins said earlier is the group met and they wanted to have another meeting before they made a recommendation. Is that correct, yes. Kevin, Cindy, or? Yes, yes. So, correct. So, 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 the, so, so how about, why don't we do this? So the, so, so the answer question is, was a recommendation provided to this board by those three members who represented that committee from this, from from us, was was a recommendation. Well, I'm gonna follow Reverend Collins' lead from last week and ask each North Charleston board member to give us a minute. But, but let me let me address that. Uh, the reason there wasn't a recommendation made when we met last Wednesday because at the last minute, Mr. Barry introduced a third option, which was Star High School. We never even considered that before. They didn't even thought about it, and so we had. Over overwhelming support to build it at Garrett. No one, want, no one wanted to put it at Northern High School football field. That's, no one showed interest to put it at Northern High School football field present that I could see from, uh, from the questions being asked and from the participation. So we said, are you guys ready to vote tonight? They said, no, give us one more meeting. And the board members were there, and Ms. Ms. Jeff was there. Somehow today she don't remember being, hearing that, but uh, <coughs> that was the agreement made in front of all the witnesses and the members in the community that we would meet again. So we promised that we would meet again in a week. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're here, because Star was introduced at the last minute. We want to give due consideration to all the factors, make a good decision. Mr. Barori said, as long as we make a decision it, by in November at the meeting, no. he still could get it done. And if October was the original deadline, he said, but he said, definitely not past November. So if we go past November, you can stand up and talk. He said, Def definitely go past November. It would, put it, it would put it out another year, wouldn't be able to get it done. So we said we have about a week or so to come up with a decision. And that's what we're trying to do. You know, get a, about a week or 10 days to find a meeting and come back with a good recommendation that we can be happy with and live with. Okay, so that's meant. Do, do we Cindy and so, Kevin, and then, then I'll get you, Jeff. You can stay there. Stay each other minutes. Right. Um, the board approved 30 members of a committee to serve on a committee to discuss with the three board members. Only 14 members of that committee came to the meeting. Mm -hmm. Other people were, who were not on the committee were asked to join the table. Um, I have the, the, the list of attendees here. Um, there was no, the people who came, there was a group of people who came who have said before, we want it built at Garrett. Mm -hmm. They don't live in North Charleston. Um, only two people on the committee were here tonight to speak and the president of the Neighborhood Association gave me permission to give you her statement. The decision or question about Stahl was actually driven from the city council member who asked why the board had never considered this. What I sent out was I sent out to over 100 people who all reside in North Charleston, who all um, are either neighborhood association presidents, live in or around Dorchester Wayland, represent Dorchester Wayland in a capacity of the city, state, or county capacity, as well as a whole host of parents of students from K-3 all the way through 12th grade, from Stahl all the way down to Chicora. Um, of those 100 people that I said, here's why I think this might be a good idea, I got one person that said they didn't think it was a good idea. The, that is it. This is a proposal. I think that we should direct staff 
to build this at stall. I have talked to <coughs> almost everybody who was at that event who responded to any kind of communication I sent out to them. I think that Garrett has to be used and not in a countywide capacity. I think it has to be used for the community of Dorchester Whalen. There are 866 elementary school students that live and are attending a public CCSD school in Dorchester Whaling. 866. And they are going to somehow have to join the other 2,000 that are in schools that are ultimately zoned for Morningside or one half of Zucker because it is a countywide partial magnet and we don't get all those seats. There are let, we're, we're okay. Time's up. Mr. Okay. <laughs> all right, Mr. Holland. Most of that wasn't well, true. Right. Mr. Holland, just to briefly rehash, as I shared with Cindy going into that meeting, um, talked to Mr. Bowers over here, Paul. He asked, "Was the meeting going to be public?" Therefore, we allowed other people within the district to come to that to that meeting. There was only a couple of people that wasn't from North Charleston in there. Let's be clear about that. But, but, but what I want to make sure we understand, just before I came to this meeting today, see how stuff can get misconstrued. Reverend Michael Brown, the council member, texts me, and you can read this text. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Just to clarify, I want to make sure that both my responses to Cindy about the CES, so my word won't be misconstrued. Michael said that he didn't mind it going to get to stall, but Michael wanted to make sure that Garrett was not left out. This is right here in the text. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. That's exactly so, what so, Michael texted. So, so my thing about it is we told the people in that room, one thing I like, I like when I give my word about something, I try to stand behind my word. When we left that room under consensus, that we were going to have one more meeting and that we were going to try to hold it on Tuesday night. And everybody was happy, energetic, felt involved. Yeah, we need to clarify. Yeah. They were concerned not only about Garrett, but the education in North Charleston. Mm -hmm. Now, as I said before, I had a couple of words with a person. They talked about, I made a mm -hmm. racial comment. No. I said, a lot of times we're insensitive to the African American needs of the constituent base that we serve. So therefore, it's not what you want. It's not, it's not what small pockets of people want. It's basically what the consensus of the body wants because they carry that message throughout North Charleston and throughout the community. One person that was at that meeting, African American sister, had a house in North Charleston, and she also had a house in another county. They started attacking her. What is she doing in that particular meeting? I've seen people I served with on boards before that weren't African American. Had two houses, many houses, in, in Charleston and other places. We didn't attack them. So therefore, I think we just need to get the time to set back up to meet, to bring the conclusion to a forefront. If, like I said in that meeting that day, if we have to call a special board meeting, we call a special board meeting. Don't have a problem with that. Well, let's not devalue the people that came to that meeting that day. Mr. Let's, Jeff, can you come up and tell us about the time frame? Were you all talking about having a meeting tomorrow, Tuesday, or Tuesday the 30th? Well, this, week, this week right here. Okay. All right. So, so Jeff, can you talk to us about time frame? I would like to clarify the timing in the memo. So the memo that you just handed around is dated the 17th, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We had it. That Four was emailed Wednesday. to the board before the meeting. So this document isn't something that I just produced. Right. You all no, had it emailed to you Jeff. last Wednesday. Pardon me, sir? We're not mad at you, Jeff. No, I'm just I'm clarifying the, yeah. what, what was given. So in paragraph one of that document that you've got now another copy of, I said that if the decision was made in October of this year, there would still be high risk of getting it done on time. When I say on time, I mean August of 2020. Mm -hmm. If the decision was made in November of 2017, it was highly unlikely that it would be done in time. After the meeting, I spoke with Reverend Collins and Mr. Hollinshed and Mrs. Coates when I reminded them that this was going to be on the agenda again for Monday. And they said one of the options we could come up with is have a, a meeting, um, have this meeting like we talked about with this committee next week, and have a special board meeting to make the board decision in ne next week or early November. Mm -hmm. My comment in here in November is for your meeting on the 27th. I can't wait until the 27th. Okay, I got if you make that. the decision on the 1st of November, That's the 31st different. of October, 
So I still, I will hold a commitment that I made in October, yeah, so but I just couldn't wait till the, I couldn't lose four more weeks. Okay. That was a clarification. Okay, all right, Mr. Miller, you are, you have the floor. So, you had a meeting, had people support it, not everybody who was invited attended, but Cindy, as you spoke, you said that the recommendation, you said you personalized it and said it was your recommendation. When did I say that? Well, as you were speaking. I, I wrote the document they're referencing. Right. It was discussed at the meeting. But it was not generated from the body. It was generated it was from you. generated from a council member who attended the meeting. Oh, I, I didn't know that he was actually a member, and he, he, he just brought it up. It was a, it was a conversation. But each person was given two minutes to talk, uh -huh. so then they never went back to that conversation. So, I did not bring this up at the meeting. Okay. okay, so the recommendation that's before us was not generated from the group okay. as a whole, nor was it generated or communicated among the three of you prior to you submitting that to us. Right. So why did we vote to make it an action item? Well, because you can vote it down, because it is a motion that will be considered, <laughs> and because I, you know, I think the fact that only two people from the committee came to tell you what was said at the committee says a lot. It says that the residents of North Charleston who all have seen this are okay with this. Well, I don't think it says that at all. I mean, I think... I don't think, I, I just want to say, I don't think because members of the committee are not present today does not mean that they're happy with the recommendation that is before us. I, I think the that, people are not I, here. I will assure you, I vetted this. First off, Stahl is an African-American school. I don't understand why we keep saying we shouldn't be taking care of the other African-American schools in North Charleston. Second. The neighborhood president on that side, the neighborhood president on the other side. You've seen the po you've seen her statement. I didn't make her statement. Right, right. So I'm talking to the actual people. There were people in that room who's asked that Kevin not keeps using his name in public that said, "I don't want this," mm -hmm. and the committee said, "Okay, we do," and kept saying. But there were people in the room that said, "I do not want this." All right, Reverend Collins. I guess I guess we had two different meetings. Uh, but I can tell you this, the people who were at the table, except with the exception of Priscilla and maybe one person, were all committee members. The overwhelmingly committee members, the other people were sitting in the back were not, were not members. They were just attending the meeting. So we had a, at least about 40, 40 people present or so, and it was a good show. And uh, it was overwhelming support to build his ass at Garrett. Except for the man that lives I there. Let, let Reverend Collins. And someone, and the second was Ms. Ms. Temple. She said, I gotta go to town. You know, she wanted to vote it then. She said, We already have the consensus. She what the crowd want. I said, Well, yes. Yeah. So the other said, Well, let's make sure since Star was in into the equation, never considered before, and they never just thought about it. We said we'll give it a few more days to have another meeting to consider Star also. And that, and that's what we stopped. That's just as honest as I know how to tell you is what happened. We didn't make a recommendation, but but if we had to make one, the consensus would have been for to go to Garrett. Okay, so the next person who had the hands up well, Priscilla before Kevin. Kevin was first. Kevin, then Priscilla. Kevin? Well, I was just briefly, you. just to make a comment to Cindy, something my daddy taught me a long time ago. Just come here, can't do what been here, been doing. Those folks that you talk to ain't dare call me and told me that. When they call and tell me that, then I'll respond. I have a long lasting relationship with a lot of them. So when they pick up the phone and call me, when they tell me that, then I can respond to your, your comment, okay? Thank you. Sure. All right, um, Priscilla? I have a completely different reason for, and I didn't, hadn't considered stall, but when it came up, then Jeff said he actually did have a plan. I mean, you had a plan to put it at each of the three high schools, right? So that was the first time I'd ever heard of it. So then I thought about it as an educator. <sighs> where are the most students? They're at stall. So you would put, in my opinion, I understand the whole neighborhood issue, and I'm not going to talk for those folks. But the, educationally, to put it at stall, there's the most amount of students in North Charleston who could access it. And I, I personally have no opinion. I mean, I think Garrett is still on the table as to what happens to Garrett. These, it'll take three years to build the uh, CAS, and that we could have another year and a half or so to, for the community to come in and decide the future of 
Garrett, and I, I mean, I don't know, but I think having the CAS at stall, if you're busing kids from North Charleston to stall, the, the traffic is going the other way in the morning and in the afternoon when the kids are going the other way, the traffic's going the other way, so. Say that again, um, please, about the traffic where now? If you're busing kids, I don't know, I'm not it's from North Charleston, traffic, but man. I've heard this, if you're busing not, kids from North Charleston mm -hmm. to there's stall in the morning, mm -hmm. there's no traffic that way, right? No. Every day, uh -uh. all day. Both all ways day. or yes, one way? Both ways. All right, well, let, okay. All right. Then I was given misinformation, so I apologize for that. But just in terms of having it built where the most students are, to me, makes sense. And one of the things is teachers going back and forth teaching at the CAS and at the high school. And you're busing less kids to, a, a, to that facility. That's just a point to think about. All right. And River Mac? So let me just spin off of uh, what uh, Mr. Barori said as far as the timeline is concerned, which gives it a little bit more light at the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. And I believe, Mr. Barori, you said that if we were to make this decision by November 27th, that would be highly okay. unlikely, okay. correct? Oh, November? Highly unlikely. Right, Where's November 27th, November? Right. right. Okay. So if then, if the committee that asked for another additional meeting were to meet, uh, when was the scheduled meeting? Was, I was saying about Thursday this week. If we Thursday could. this week? No, okay. I could go for Thursday if we could. So, yeah, we agree. so to give the committee that we appointed another option or another meeting date and time, uh, if they were to meet the 27th or, or to meet this Thursday, and then give the three board members a recommendation uh, to come back to the board with, and then possibly maybe have a special call meeting, telephonic uh, conference and board meeting uh, to discuss the matter um, it, here next week. That will, I think, give you enough time. Uh, we'll still be within October's time frame, uh, which will be uh, high risk, but we'll still be within the, the scope of, of making a decision. Would that, would that be fair uh, as far as the timeline? So. I haven't said that. I don't know if there's something. You got another question? I want to make a recommendation. Oh, okay. I want to make, I want to make two statements, and maybe we'll circle back to you, and you can make the recommendation. All right. Yeah, All Chris, right. and then Michael. Okay, Mr. Stiles. All right, so I got two comments. First, one thing I keep on hearing that this is, uh, I guess, historical or historically black school. Uh, I just want to say that, you know, it's 2017, it was 2018. The idea of institutionalizing an all-black school or all-white school is pr probably something we want to move away from eventually. So I, I just want to make that comment just because I know that seems to be one of the selling points on everything we do, and I'm not sure that's what we should aspire to in this, in this decade. Uh, number two, maybe I can get some input from the, the three board members on the committee, but what does placing the CAS on the Garrett High School land do for keeping Garrett High School? Is the idea that we'll have like a trade school and a trade school next to each other, or how's that work? That's, I just want, I'm trying to figure that out. Is it duplication, maybe, Kevin? Kevin, you want to answer that? Well, I'll tell you what it is. Can I? Just not. No, I'm not. I'm just trying to get on okay. the, the roster next. Okay. Having a having a quality school in that particular neighborhood um, brings about new home ownership. People are attracted to something new. So, so therefore, it'll get it improve the value of the homes in the area. People, are real estate guys, and, and I'm pretty sure Todd can attest to this much. That it, that it make people move around that particular area. There's a new school in the area, so so that's what it does. But basically, going back to what you're saying, the folks in North Charleston can't help what they live at. You know, the plight of what happened in the city, what the city being um, developed, and, and, and the folks moved to North Charleston, they're crushed up in the one particular area now. So therefore, it, the numbers just increase. So they don't have no choice. It does become an African American school. So, so therefore, the needs are different. That we wouldn't be talking about a CES in North Charleston if we didn't have a need to try to reach everyone. Mm -hmm. So, therefore, all we're saying is, is that Garrett is overlooked. And I said this in the meeting there. North Charleston is overlooked. I want to do something for both Star schools. Mm -hmm. Well, Star has a new school. They have, they have programs up there. And please, just beg my intelligence for a second. Not taking nothing away from Stall. But those schools are traditionally in a particular area that actually need help. 
as Michael said and as Todd talked about the corridor of Sheen, those schools need resources, content time, and programs to help improve the quality of life of the people that serve. We just don't kick them in the butt and throw them away and then try to move them around and displace them. So therefore, we have to do whatever it takes to make that a very successful area. That's all. All right, so, so would it replace Garrett or would it be next to Garrett? That's what I'm trying to figure out. Sir? Well, I mean, okay. you know, you, you get it down to one person's opinion that they don't want it near where they live, and then they, and everybody's in the, they ain't but a small group of people that are putting up a fight about it being in Garrett's area. Um, and there's and this a small group of people that want to keep the stadium um, up in North Charleston. But again, we can serve, I think one person at, at, at that meeting talked about a cluster between the two schools. Okay. Let's serve both schools. Let's make both schools successful. Let's put, invest in both tier of families. One thing I heard from other educators around the state and also locally, that big high schools don't necessarily mean better. Michael, I, I, rely, I like, rely on Michael for the numbers sometimes, but we need to look at what a large scale high school does for African American kids or disadvantaged kids in the school and look at those numbers and pull to see do it really helps. Small environments, small educational needs have a, a tailored individual values to deal with that small group of individuals in that school. So we're in the business of making people successful. We need to make sure that we look at every aspect of things. That's all. And then the thing about it is those people that came in that room, as I think my good friend Dr. Um, Dixon said, he, he, he basically said, we invested our time to come to that meeting that day. We owe the respect to them to give them another meeting to basically sit down and then hash this out and then make a decision. Ultimately, at the end of the day, it's the board members up here that are going to have to make the final decision. But just as, just as we, I came over to Mount Pleasant and sat with that group of 500 people and listened to y'all, you know, talk to them, it was to respect the North Charleston the same way, that's all. So that's why I'm asking. All right, thank you, buddy. All right, hold on, Mr. Miller. Have you spoken yet, Michael? Uh, I have. I just wanted to right. make a quick comment. Okay. okay. I'll I'll answer, answer the question. Um, okay. I, I came across a document the other day, and I, I meant to ask the district to pull it for me to see exactly what it read. But the document that I had showed the the, the capital projects that were on the list in 2014, and that list had the Center for Advanced Studies on it. North Charleston, and in parentheses, it had Garrett attached to it. So I took that to mean that the Center for Advanced Studies would basically replace the Garrett building okay. and would possibly have the name attached to it at the same site. That's how I took what I read. So when I hear us talk about potentially moving the Center for Advanced Studies, a trade program for some, you know, who are, you know, the Center for Advanced Study is a modern term that we use, but, you know, older folk call it a trade school. If it's no longer on that campus, the question then becomes, what happens to Garrett currently? Oh, I got what happens to that school? What happens to that property? How was that property used? Will it be sold? Whatever the case may be. I don't believe you've had that conversation yet, but I think we have to consider, or at least we should consider, the future of that site as it pertains to the Center for Advanced Studies. Now we've had, in our last board meeting, we had, I can't remember the gentleman's name, who's, who's helping us with our early college um, center over at Trident Tech, the one at Trident Tech. But I also want us to start considering and looking at the prerequisites that we may be asking students to have mm -hmm. to take the classes mm -hmm. at the Center for Advanced Studies. Wando, Center for Advanced Studies, has prerequisites for certain courses and certain offerings that students want to take. I think, we need be, I think we need to be very deliberate in understanding exactly the needs of the students who live in North Charleston, what their interests are, compare that to what the chamber may want, because the chamber may want something that our students may not be desiring. They may want something that our students right now might not be able to do. So there may need to be some type of intervention and support provided at the student base level. I don't want us to get ahead of ourselves and talk about this great, wonderful CAS program and not talk about the academics that it will take for our students to have 
in place to be able to take advantage of the programming, which we're still working on what those programming will be at the Center for Advanced Studies. So when you hear people say the closing of a school, I believe that's what they're referencing. Okay. Because I think the fear is if the Center for Advanced Studies is on North Charleston's campus, where the old stadium is, what happens to the Garrett School? It probably, we don't know, dissolves, stay. Same thing at Stahl. I wasn't aware, based on the last meeting, I remember Jeff mentioning that Garrett and North Charleston had an acreage footprint that would accommodate a Center for Advanced Studies. He did not mention that at our last board meeting sitting here as an option. I'm not saying that wasn't an option. The stall footprint. I'm not saying that wasn't an option then, but it was not given to the board as an option. I believe if that option was presented to us prior to you guys making that committee, prior to you guys hearing the concerns of the community and not toward probably the end of that conversation, but at the front end, I don't think we'd be here having the same conversation today. Mm -hmm. okay. That's why I had, I mean, I needed it to be brought to discuss. Uh, yeah. With respect to the, the process and, and the committee, that is, we've been discussing this for years. I mean, this has been, this was, I mean, the first time it was ever even brought up to me was by a pastor in North Charleston. We were meeting about an altogether different issue, and the pastor said, oh, you know, Garrett's going to be closed when they move CAS and consolidate it with, um, at, when it's born, when it, yeah, when it's built at North Charleston. So, I mean, the, any committee, I have a vote, and I was elected to vote, not to tie my hands to a committee. So, I mean, and y'all were also given a date by which to come back with, and, and so that didn't happen. So I feel like in the interest of focusing on the results for kids, we need to wrap this up and move on. Make a decision. I'm ready to vote one way or the other and just move on from this because we've discussed it look for, for months and months. Right, hold on one sec. I, 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 I want to say something real And quick I feel like this is all tactics and has nothing to do. This is all an effort just to delay things tactics. to get an answer rather it's just than, like you wrote the letter you no, put in hey, the hey, about this hey, corridor is hey, a tactic guys. no no so, i'm talking about the results for kids no, wait, I don't I don't know. Kids. They yeah, that, no. kevin tom all right mm -hmm. so one one point i just want to make is i i think there has been discussion at some point there probably was discussion about garrett would close when the north charleston cas opened i think there's very strong consensus that we've heard from the community that they want Garrett to exist. Some people want Garrett to continue just like it is. Other people feel like, oh my gosh, North Charleston is growing like crazy. And if it makes sense to put the CAS on a campus with another high school, whether it's North Charleston or CAS, I mean, or Stahl, because of a number of reasons, um, then we want to make sure we keep Garrett as a neighborhood school and North Charleston be a neighborhood school, school whatever a it might be. Because um, I, I feel very strongly about that. I don't want to see us tear down Garrett in any way. I do feel like we could, we'd, we'd be serving our kids better by having the CAS attached to a high school. Reverend Collins, you're next, and then. Uh, I, I, think, um, I think Reverend Mac uh, kind of brought out the points that I, that I was really trying to get at, that uh, the committee didn't reach a decision that night in. I requested a few more days, and Mr. Barori had agreed to it, and, uh, and that's where we're kind of where we stand. At. This is nothing personal for me, but I want to see good for all our schools in North Charleston. We've closed a number of schools in North Charleston more than any other place in Charleston County. Schools, our schools have been closing down, and that's answer Mr. Starr's question: What will happen if we put it at Garrett? Mm -hmm. Well, immediately the enrollment's going to double. That's guaranteed because the type classes and curriculum that will come, kids are going to be attracted from across the county. They're going to come, they're going to enroll at Garrett. Yeah. Before, even before this thing last year, I think Garrett enrolled, I want to say it was around 500 students or so. So, so just, just imagine what's going to happen when we put those other courses there and the kids realize what we're offering in North Charleston, they're going to come flocking in. And parents that have left the school district, a lot of those people yeah. will come back to uh, Charleston County just to get a part of, be a part of the CS program. So, so it saves the school, it also revives the school, and then you don't have to spend more money so uh, re relocating uh, Teachers. So, so, so I, think it's a, I think it's the most suitable thing. But, but I want to come back in, uh, in a few days with a recommendation. All right, so you're not envisioning it being like the Mount Pleasant CAS where no. people come from other schools. You're, you're thinking yes, it's like. Yes, he is. Yeah. It depends oh, on. Oh, they would. 
Right, so wait, Well, we get it, it's North Charleston it primarily, but if we open up kind of why they can't come. All right, hold on, Priscilla. But it's a guarantee. Um, I'm confused. I think we, sometimes <laughs> it seems like we get a little confused. CAS is not a school, it's a program. program we know that. Yeah. So you have to go to a high school and then attend classes at I CAS. Know. Know and that. of course, I think it should be attached to a high school. It makes more sense. Sure. I would have thought, I would have said North Char Charleston High School until I went to the meeting, and so many people at that meeting did not want it at North Charleston High School. Well, that's why stall became a more attractive yeah. option to me. But if you have it at Garrett, it's just a. No, no, go ahead. It's Garrett is a school. It is a school. It would yeah. have to be attached to a school, but it's yeah, in itself. Right. It's exactly not. Right. It's just a program. I just All right, to Cindy, that. and then Robert. So I just because I want to make sure that we understand <laughs> something. Stall is 80 percent poverty. It means that 80% of its students are either free or reduced, live below the poverty line, are in foster care, or are homeless. What difference does that make? It Are means I that I am. Collins? Yeah, what difference does that make, Chris? Yeah, what difference does it make? All right, go ahead, you brought please, it up. Ms. Coates. So it means that all of the schools in North Charleston have similar demographics. This is not, this isn't an attempt to, to do anything to a demographic. Not all the schools. Um, there are. 14 elementary schools, three neighbor, three, three and a half neighborhood middle schools, two neighborhood high schools, two partial magnet elementary schools that draw half their seats from all over the county, one partial magnet middle school that draws half its seats from all over the county, four countywide magnet high schools in North Charleston, two of which do not have enrollment requirements. We need Garrett as a neighborhood community school in North Charleston. North Charleston does not need to continue having magnet schools where kids that live in that neighborhood don't attend that school, which is what we have. To pull back the magnet then? So I'm saying that we need to have Garrett as a community school. Who's like a magnet? Y'all heard it. Chris, what did you ask this morning? May I, may I, I'm, I'm sorry. I thought Chris had told me that he wasn't going to interrupt if I didn't. Go ahead. Are you, go ahead. So, <laughs> I think that, there, you know, my idea for the middle school for Garrett came from Charleston Rise. Those moms have come to me and said, and they also meet in North, at the City Hall in North Charleston, and said, our kids are doing better in our, mid, in our elementary schools in the Dorchester Whaling community than they ever have before, and what are you school district doing to get our kids ready because they're going to be in middle school in three years. We need a quality middle school in our community for our children. That was brought from the community and the parents. There's no way this district doesn't need to utilize Garrett as a community-based high school. But we have sat here and talked about the Garrett as if that we're trying to do something to it we're trying to do something for the community, and right now that is not a community school. And when we build the CAS at West Ashley, I don't know why children will ride on a bus from West Ashley past their CAS to come to Garrett because it's a technology school. We're, we're going to have these in other areas. We need to be talking about North Charleston as a whole of North Charleston. And Stahl has done an amazing job, but the biggest issue is, look at the issues we have discussed in the past. Buses. The buses on James Island were, a, were such an issue that we agreed to move the bus lot. Those buses were located 0.13 miles from the nearest house, whereas if this CAS goes on the football field at Garrett and they have to build that bus loop coming and going, it is 243 feet from the houses from that entire side row of houses. It's, it's through a neighborhood that cannot have an entrance across the back because Bennett Rail Yard stretches from Meeting Street all the way past Dorchester. It is landlocked. It, it, a landlocked school of that nature doesn't need to be drawing students from all over when the students from that very community can go to that school. And I think that Garrett is a middle school. <laughs> I want that and I've been asked that 50 times in the last week, but I do think we need to ask the neighborhood if they want that. So I'm not sitting here and, and nothing in the two pages I sent y'all, I talked about the acreage, the fact that it's not located near 
communities that have in the past complained about having that kind of inevitable issues related there, those are the reasons it should be located at Stahl. Not because Garrett shouldn't be a school, but because Garrett should be a community school and should not be pulling people from all over God's creation to go there. All right, Reverend Mack. Uh, Madam Chair, I want to introduce a, a new motion and then the call to vote. Okay. There's not an existing motion on the yeah, table. Yeah. yeah. There's no motion. So Make there a was motion. not a second on the current motion. I was already. There was no motion, no motion right, made. Well, let by me anybody. Introduce, introduce a new motion. Uh, my new motion will be that. Uh, I said it yet. <laughs> my new motion would be that. Uh, Thursday, October 26th, the community will host their uh, second meeting uh, that has been requested, and that one week later, on Thursday, November 2nd, uh, that we have a, a telephonic uh, board meeting uh, to make a final decision on the CAS. Second. Second. Okay. Call Thursday, a question. Thursday, October yes. 22nd is the yes. district-wide strategic action plan planning session downtown at Burke. It is also the North Charleston City Council meeting. I think we, if, okay. if, if, if you guys Hope. have said we have got to respect the community, we, Hold tight. Hold I, tight. we need to, Mike, um, Chris Collins put city council members on there, which I think was a brilliant idea, but he did. Okay. All right. Let me um, rephrase so we, my we motion. we probably have to have the committee come up to a date consensus. Okay. I'll rephrase my motion, but I will stand firm with November 2nd mm -hmm. for the telephonic uh, board meeting, but that the committee convene prior to the November 2nd uh, uh, meeting that will be held uh, by the board. So second. your motion is that we delay this until having a special called meeting on November 2nd for this one item. The committee will determine the date and time that they will have the, the meeting. I'm asking but, about the board meeting. Uh, I know, but I'm, I'm just, yeah. But November 2nd will be uh, the telephone meeting. Right, so we are voting on November 2nd. Yes. 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 Okay. So I mean, irrespective I mean, of whether the committee does anything or not. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yes. So we, the motion is for the committee to convene and make a recommendation, and we have a board meeting on Thursday, a special call board meeting on Thursday, November 2nd, to take action. Right. And Madam Chair, yeah. if I may, and, and I'm sorry, what? He said yeah, telephonic. I mean, if people can yeah. be here, they can be If here. I may, and Reverend Mack, with all due respect, every one of you have, including myself, have sat up here and said this is a big deal. This is something people need to see, and we, we've talked about transparency, we've talked about inclusion. I can't reconcile that with a telephonic meeting. Okay. I think it needs to be a meeting that the board members need I to I can't attend. be here. So, well, well Priscilla's going to be out of That's, the country, but it's got to be a telephonic meeting. Or, or oh. you, you're going to be able to call in either way anyway. Whoever so can be here should be here. Okay. So we'll work, start, starting tomorrow, we'll work uh -huh. on scheduling mm -hmm. board members' calendars for November yeah. 2nd, mm -hmm. and then the committee can work. All right. And, and try to avoid the noon time. I got my... Okay. It needs to be in the afternoon and evening, because the same way as a regular board meeting so would be. Can come. All right. So... We have a motion. We have a second. What I hear you guys saying is for the November 2nd meeting, we probably need to do it, try and do it at 5 so the public can come. Mm -hmm. If somebody had, Priscilla's going to be out of town, out of the country, we'll see if we can figure something out. Maybe, That's maybe. 10 at night. Okay. you got to stay up late. Up. Let's, Let's do it so. earlier in the day. I mean, we're That's to why get, I said telephonic, but yeah. we're trying to everybody get, we're trying to get community well, to yeah, come then. Well, uh, we'll, we'll there, is a, there is a community group that's meeting with these three folks over here who represent the North Charleston area. Try to get answers to this question. I still don't completely understand whether we're replacing the current gear right. with ACAS no, 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 or whether it's going to be a middle school and or I think it's a high invited. school. Okay, you, and let's just know. one thing: we need too. to make sure that Mr. Barrowe can be at the committee meeting so he can answer any questions. Uh, Gordon, Gordon, because you asked him about the programming. Yeah, okay, Gordon so did. we have a motion and a second. Do we have any other discussion or can we have question? A vote? Just, just one more. Just, I don't want this to be part of the motion, but I'm hoping that this will be part of. The recommendation that you guys bring back to us, there needs to be clarity on whether or not the new building, wherever it's going to be built, mm -hmm. if I'm sorry, if it's not going to be built on a campus, is it going to be a program or a center for advanced studies at either the North Charleston or the Stahl site? If it's going to be a program at Garrett, or is it going to be a freestanding school at yes. Garrett with its own best code? Mm -hmm. And if it is, how are we going to fund Right. that program when the enrollment currently is less than 500 and so it would it would cost it would create an extra line item in the budget right. for us to fund this I, I heard that there may be some additional funds available i'm hoping with that recommendation coming back no matter what it is that the district would do their due diligence to bring us back ideas of how we're going to properly fund this and what it will look like 
Yes. Okay. That's well, fine. All right. That's good. But what we voted for in the 2000, I mean, I think we voted for a CAS, which is a program. So, okay. But, but again, if they come back with something right. different, yeah, we'll have to figure that out. That's all the question. Call the question. Mr. Holland Shea. Aye. Ms. Coates. Aye. Mr. Garrett. Yes. Reverend Collins. Yes. Ms. Jeffrey. Yes. Mr. Miller. Aye. Uh, Mr. Yes. Scobbs. Reverend Mack. Yes. And I vote yes. The motion passes. Thank you, Reverend Mack. Thanks mm -hmm. for the good discussion. The next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report. Are you ready? We're ready. We're ready. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, well, I'm going to try to just get my thoughts together about um, what we wanted to talk about this evening. It, it, it is focusing on... Can't be. <laughs> focusing on district capacity student achievement uh, primarily so I'm going to just briefly we um, in, last summer started looking at a research project called school district leadership that works um, you'll recall this document, yes? Yeah, mm -hmm. Yes. It multiple yeah. times. Um, so I'm just going to summarize it for us so that we're, um, we know what we're looking at. Uh, Jeff, could you, or um, Andy, could you forward, please? Thank you. Um, so what we know over time is that, that the best research studies that have been produced over years say that students bring about 60 to 70 percent of the contributing factors to student achievement with them. The school, the teachers, the district contribute about 30 to 40 percent of achievement. So that means that schools and districts have to maximize every bit of that 30 to 40 percent of the influence that we have. So what does research tell us about those contributing factors? So this handout is, the slides are in small print um, for each of you um, if, in case you want to look at them. It tells us that home environment for students, home environment, what is called learned intelligence, and we know that intelligence is plastic. We talk about the plasticity of intelligence or growth mindset depending on the kind of environment that challenges us to think. And student motivation to learn are huge contributing factors to achievement. At the school level, there are five factors. A guaranteed and viable curriculum. Guaranteed means it's delivered to every single child. And viable means it's proven that it works for children who need to learn that particular part of the learning agenda. With challenging goals and effective feedback, parent and community involvement, safe and orderly environments in which to learn, and collegiality and professionalism within the school. That's the climate that characterizes that school. So that goes primarily to school leadership. And then at the teacher level, there are three huge things that teachers do. The instructional strategies they use to engage kids, their classroom management strategies, and the way they design the classroom learning experiences make a big difference. So those are the things that, that all of the research studies we can gather tell us make a difference. So what difference do school district boards and superintendents make? Um, so what we did in that study that we read was to look at a meta-analysis, a big study um, involving 3.4 million kids and many research studies that have been done. It's the largest research study of its kind and it says that when superintendents and boards work together, when they team up, and stay focused on student achievement and agree on what they're trying to achieve and how they're trying to achieve it, they can make an impact on student achievement. They identified six district level leadership and, and board res responsibilities that work together to make the, the right kind of learning climates at the schools. And they're all related to goal setting and keeping the focus on kids and learning. So this is what that difference looks like. Um, we know that Charleston County Schools scores about where this, this uh, gray band is here. We are slightly above average in terms of the amount of growth that we produce among students. That's not good enough. Higher performing school districts are way up in between that plus three and plus two. So we need to move up the growth that we're getting from students. And as we move growth, we'll see um, improvements in the actual achievement. But you can't win the race. Till you, till you move faster. So that's why growth has been so important to us. 
And that gray band there shows the difference that boards and superintendents can make when they work together. So I just want to talk really quickly about then what it looks like to have a community that feeds into a board. Then we have schools, and we've talked about what schools, the difference that schools make with principals and teachers, the difference that kids bring. So what's the role of the district office? So the superintendent connects with the board that represents the public. The principals connect with the superintendent and lead the schools. And in that middle circle then, we have the functions that occur at the district level, the human resources, finance, the legal department, the communications, learning services, and operations. But across the middle, and this is the piece that we've not built well in Charleston County Schools since I came here. We were organized differently until July, early July of 2015, and then a change in the system organization was made from five learning communities to a different pattern of elementary, middle, and secondary. And so the role of, of those executive directors that link from right, everything through the district to the principals becomes incredibly important. So as we build the curriculum, as we build the human resource expectations, it's only been 10 years since, since people, since teachers were hired by this board. Up until 10 years ago, they were hired by constituent boards. So this, uh -huh. this district has undergone a lot of changes in that period of time, and we're just now reaching the point. You had good leadership over that time, and leaders who did a great job of building those systems. We're just now at the place where we're finishing the job of getting those systems in place. So our job together is to, is to agree on what these... Uh, uh, what the system priorities ought to be, what, what direction, what, where are we moving to? And that needs to come very clearly from the board through um, the superintendent, the district staff, to principals and schools. So the schools then understand what the system outcomes look like and how to be answerable for those outcomes in a way that's fair and, and supportive. So that's the system that we now need to build together. This is the work to be done as we clarify our goals for this year into next spring. So that's why this research becomes really important because it talks about the fact that we need to ensure that we have agreement on the goals and the principals need to be involved in that. Then we need to set non-negotiable goals for instruction. So all the principals this year have achievement goals built into their evaluations and that will be We'll be sort of aggregating that up and bringing that to the board because that will help us understand the growth that we expect to see at the district level. And that's based on the baseline achievement that they uh, exhibited last year in their schools. The board maintains support for those goals and achievement, and we seek training together so that we understand what that kind of unified leadership looks like. We monitor program implementation and student achievement. We use resources to support instruction, and we create clear expectations and then provide the schools the freedom that they need to operate within those expectations. So I'm not going to say a whole lot about um, Richard Elmore's research at Harvard University, but the point he makes is knowing the right thing to do is, is the central issue here. So as we're working with people, it's not enough just to hold people accountable. We have to build capacity through supporting. So these, these four things on the left are what we need to try to do. The four things on the right are what we often do, but they don't produce results. So instead of just focusing on accountability, we have to build capacity. How do we know that people know how to do these things we're asking them to do? Instead of just focusing on individual performance, we have to look at the group quality. What are we able to do together as a whole grade level team or a school? Instead of just focusing on technology, implementing technology, we have to focus on instructional quality. What difference did it make? What difference did it make that we use technology with kids or that they have one-on-one -on -one devices? What instructional impact did we want that technology to have? And it should be to figure out where kids are, to personalize their instruction so they're showing continuous progress along a continuum. And then finally, a systemic focus instead of fragmented programs. And that's a huge job that we need to work on together this year is getting that focus as a system and knowing where these individual goals or programs fit. 
um, we talked about a, a phonics program. Well, why did we do that? Where does that fit in the whole system? Does everyone need it, or are there particular schools that need that more than others? So the point here is that we need to focus as a leadership team on capacity building, on group quality, on making sure that we have instructional quality and systemic focus. So the strategic priorities that should be coming, um, you're going to get a lot of recommendations through the strategic planning action team groups, but we need to focus on three strategic priorities, and I mentioned them to you earlier. One is investing our resources wisely and fairly, and that is about equity. Equity is difficult to understand, and it is not a popular concept. So the challenge is how do we make sure that, that our highest performing students continue to have the programs and supports they need while increasing the resources to our lowest performing students who are not faring nearly as well in our system as, as their counterparts. They're not growing as quickly, and they're not um, achieving at the levels that, that we know they have to achieve at. So we had to get the budget stabilized. You can't deal with equity. You can't work on equity until you get the budget stabilized. So we've accomplished that. Then we really have to focus on developing talent. We've talked a lot about that. And then we, we must understand exactly how we're focusing on and being answerable for increasing the percentage of students are, who are ready. Are we going to start at the early elementary and early childhood levels and, in, and put our, our resources into creating more students who are able to read by grade three? Or are we going to distribute those resources across the K-12 continuum? And that is a big question that we've not wrestled with and made a decision about at this board table since I have been here. But this year we must do that in December as we start to build our budget for next year. And then we've got to make a three to five year plan and really stick with it and push hard on what's working, whether we're getting the results. So I'm just going to talk a, a bit about first order change versus second order change. Another thing that the research talks to us about is how much change your system needs. If your system's generally doing pretty well, getting the results you want, it just needs tweaking. That's first order change. Whether you have a, a semester schedule, or a seven period day is a that's a first order change it's hard to do but it still doesn't change appreciably what's happening in the quality of services for kids a second order change though is tremendously disruptive to a system it is a break with the past and people are moved out of their comfort zones it's outside any of our existing understanding or paradigms about how this system works or how school works it conflicts with what people are accustomed to, the prevailing values and norms. It requires new skill and knowledge to implement. It's a disturbance to every element of the system, and it's really, really complex. But if we're going to make a difference for the kids who most rely on public schools to get it right for them, we need to work together. We need to set priorities together. And I've suggested to you what I think those three big priorities ought to be equity in the distribution of talent and money and time, talent development, and getting really clear about what it looks like to get kids ready and expanding what we know is working in some of the sites in our system. So I won't spend more time on these things, but included in your board packets for today were the first quarter results. We have goals for 2017-18 and you have those first quarter results in your board packets for today, you may want to ask to spend some time with those, on those results at a committee of the whole meeting, but I just want to make you aware the clock is ticking on this school year. We set some very clear goals, and the status report is included in, in today's materials. The next thing I wanted to point out is that um, there is a one-day training seminar in Columbia on November 3rd um, where Advanced Ed will be reviewing effective board governance, the observation tool. There are 24 different um, criteria, that the board and superintendent, criteria the board and superintendent are to meet. If any of you want to go to the November 3rd training session, please let us know immediately. Um, the next thing I wanted to mention was the open office hours, the summer report. We've had, at this point, fewer than 50 people take advantage of open office hours, but the feedback that they've given has been really rich and, um, and helpful. So we've 
the staff and I have been at meetings almost every <coughs> night in October. We are uh, pretty well booked through the end of October at, at meetings almost every night, and there was a list of those meetings in your packet. And then finally, um, Mr. Garrett has had to leave. We had hoped that he would just summarize the financial report, which you've received um, before it was in your packet. We wanted to mention um, both Mr. Garrett and uh, Reverend Mack, who's the vice chair of the um, Audit and Finance Committee. Um, we wanted to mention that they are working, they discussed at the last Audit and Finance Committee meeting the need to address substitute salaries. It's substitute something teachers. Substitute, substitute teacher teachers. salaries. Right. That um, is a matter that came up last spring. Uh, we, yeah, didn't, up we didn't include it in the uh, budget revisions, but we are working on it. Mr. Brigman's been working on some recommendations, and we will have those soon ready to bring to you. We know that's an area that must have attention. So we just wanted to mention that tonight as part of the financial report. And that concludes, that was kind of a run through of, of, of things that deserve a whole lot more time and attention, but you've had a lengthy evening already. Thank you, you, you very you, much. Do you, do, you, do you have any, uh, any data in the first quarter report? You have a lot of data. But we've, provi we've provided data to you in the first quarter, and those data are from the last meeting. They're I've right there. They're right there. Okay, okay. This whole packet, okay. packet okay. right here. This, this is, the thing this is that, it's it. multiple it. measures of every yeah, school. Last meeting too. And they're right. And then what's missing yet are the secondary schools because a significant portion of their data are embargoed. They're, it's late this year because it's and that's embargoed by, by the state. state. Right. Okay. All right. And as you said, you all, the group of audit finance is already looking at increasing, so making a recommendation for substitute pay, so then may have been yes, around the columns. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I highly support that. Okay. Um, all right. The next item on our agenda is item 9.1, which is the choice um, magnet programs for 2000. 18, 19, and this is um, Judith Peterson presented this to us. Is with, she here tonight? Uh, I don't think she is here tonight. We we had lengthy just we had that workshop. Is she? Right. Sure. Judith's hiding yeah. back there. Yes, Judith is here to answer any questions if anybody has them. Do I have a, a motion? Yes, I want to. Uh, it just yes. Let me find mine again. Uh, I'll just use this one there. Okay. But, uh, I have a question for yeah. Ms. Peterson. Okay. So, Ms. Peterson, can you come on up? Thank you. Cindy has a question for you. Mrs. Peterson, at the committee meeting, the committee agreed that the students would take the additional summer support, but that they would still have to score 13 after the summer support, and I don't see that in here. Have we decided that they don't have to score the 13? Score the 13. Well, we, we did not indicate that they would be retested in exactly the same way. We indicated that they would be given standardized evaluations to assess the growth in the areas that were weak in the initial application. We certainly can do um, to set it up for the 13, that is, I have no problem with that. I don't have the, um, the uh, I don't have the option to do the map testing and some of the other things that are part of the initial application. Right. But we can, we can do other standardized testing in order to make sure that they're, uh, if they're weak in math, that they have compensated for that weakness and have brought that score up. So, in... We're still struggling with the fact that we're going to have a kid who is not number one or number two in their school, as picked by their principal, who will score higher yes. and be excluded from this school than a child who's put in there. Yes. And that, I, I just, I want to know how we're able to justify that kid getting in with a score that's lower than the kid who was not allowed in. So then this, be, 
I, I just, I, I'm for this because I want my kids in academic magnet, make no mistake. But, but let, I, I don't want to be sitting here being accused of being, you know, unfair to certain demographics or having Reverend Collins call me racist again because the top two kids at Lane get in and they are inevitably by, by just sheer numbers of students are going to be Caucasian and God forbid we have a minority student not ranked one or two in a primarily white school that does not get in. If you yeah. need to look at that and say we're okay with that. We're guaranteeing the number one and number two in all schools because we have to do it fairly. This was going to be targeted to certain schools because we know the number one and two and five and ten and fifty at Lang are going to get in. But if we apply this, as, as the attorney says, to all schools, we're, that means all middle schools. And I'm okay with this. I'm just not okay that the board comes back and beats y'all up later when this co creates a scenario that it could create. Essentially, what we've developed, or de what we're developing, are two ways to get into Academic Magnet High School. One way is through the general application process, and many students will will get in, many students, many more students will be on a waiting list because they meet the criteria. The second avenue, and it's completely separate, is through the top two. So if the top two students, some of the top two students are going to have scored 13.25 and get in, and they're gonna be students with 13.875 who do not get in probably from the same school. Okay, so, and so we are, I, as, long as, as long as we can do this, I, I say move ahead, more power to us. I just wanna make okay. sure that there are gonna be those scenarios, and if it turns out that two girls get in and a boy doesn't, I don't want this board, <laughs> as it inevitably does, comes back and blames y'all right. for a scenario that we clearly could see in the, in, in the beginning of the scenario. So I think if we the top separate two kids, the two Right, so the pieces. top two, so there is now a way, and do we have a objective way that those top two will be determined, so we're not yes. also sitting here saying, well, the principal chose the top two. No, there is a there is a, an algorithm that April Lee has, she used it last year in terms of the weighted um, grading, the South Carolina weighted grading scale for math, science, social studies, and ELA. Because Chris Stobbs is going to get an email from the number three girl who should have been the number two, and it's going to be some, I, I don't want it to be a person's decision. It will, it will be an electronic decision. Then I make a motion to approve the motion before us to create this secondary way of having the top two students, and we can get a second and continue the discussion. Okay, so we have a motion, do we have a second? Well, let, let me make my presentation first. Well, wait, can, why don't you put, second it so we can have just a second? I don't second. want to second her motion to me. I want to present mine. Okay, do we have a second? I'll second it. All right, thank you, Michael. So we have a motion and a second. Reverend Collins? All right, thank you, Ms. <coughs> Ms. Peterson. Uh, so right now you have about 3% uh, three, three African-American population at your school. It's not her, it's not, she's not the principal. Yeah, well, your phone was good. I got you. Time, I hear you. I hear you. You know, so what I'm thinking about that the, the makeup of Charleston County's district is about, so I say half African American and almost half uh, Caucasian and, and with others. And so the, the, the mystery is, the mystery is bringing about diversity in a fair way that, that doesn't offend people. We don't want nobody to think that we're just trying to stick kids into the school, but we just want to make sure it's fair and, uh, an equal opportunity and equitable for everybody. And one thing I thought about it is uh, that, once, that we didn't consider, but we need to consider it. Uh, kids coming out of middle school, and those teachers that teach those kids, uh, they, have their, they have their own rigor and <coughs> they know what they're looking for. And I wondered, and have we, are, we using this, are we using the teachers from middle school as adjudicators? Missions back in Magnet High School, are the middle school teachers being used at all yeah, as adjudicators? Well, everything for Academic Magnet High School is done electronically. If you are a Charleston County School District student, your uh, GPA is, is uh, calculated electronically, your MAP scores are put in electronically. Uh -huh. The writing sample is the only place where there is um, Adjudicator. adjudicators, and those have been historically. Um, the 10 or 11 uh, English teachers and social studies teachers at Academic Magnet High School. Okay, and that's the point I'm getting at. So what, 
So let's say you made that group much more diverse in that. Pardon me? Let's say, let's say they made that group much more diverse in the sense that you use teachers that don't teach like academic math in high school, which is us, but I say half of them are for the, from the middle schools that taught. Because I think, I think what's happening, I think their standards may be a little different than the standards at the middle school level, because they're teaching on the high school level. And so they're, they may, maybe they're looking for ninth and 10th grade performance, just for example, or 11th grade performance. Whereas the middle school teacher, she may, she may be looking for a top notch eighth grade performance. So, so her, her judgment may be a little different than someone back in the high school. So if you have a diverse panel, you would get a mixture of decisions uh, when the adjudicators mm -hmm. make a decision. It won't all be the same way. They all are looking for the same thing according to your school's tradition. Well, and we do. The student, the teachers all get together and they practice with writing samples and they come to consensus and they agree with the rubric and they practice. And um, I've been doing it 10 years. I, I have great faith in their process and the, um, the subjectivity and the, the, the objectivity, excuse me, and the ability to assess a piece of writing and how that piece of writing will um, grow and give these children success at Academic Magnet High School. Uh, I, I have no objection necessarily to talking with the principal at Academic Magnet to see if, there are, if they want to expand that writing group, but we've been really successful with it um, up to this point. The, re the reason I ask you that is I've, I've been told in the past that most kids are, are broken or disqualified because of the writing sample. Is this what I've been told? That, 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 that's that's not, it's, it's all <laughs> kinds of things. It could be a child whose math map score was just a little bit below the 85th percentile and so they didn't get full points for that. It could be that their GPA, that they had a two Bs, in which case that would bring the GPA down to, instead of 4.0, it might be 3.875. There's a variety of places where that can happen. It's not always in the writing sample. But you would admit that the writing sample weighs heavy and influences a lot of decisions for a lot of the children, wouldn't you say that? The, so writing, sam the writing sample is a major factor that determines whether it's, kids get in or not. It really isn't, sir. It, it's, it's, it could be the MAP score, it could be the GPA, and it could be the writing sample. They are all weighted the same. They're each right. worth four, four points. Four points each. Yeah. All right, lastly, I was considering the motion that's being presented about the top two students, and we did that last year, maybe even the year before, too. But, uh, but I'd like to see that expanded. And where we're, where we're hurting at the most is that it's not just the top two schools, but top two students in, in middle schools, but it's the schools that are underrepresented. The students, the students that don't really know about the program and don't really have access, and there's really no teacher to push them and guide them into the program. So my, my thoughts would be this, instead of using two from each two school, that you would probably try to focus on the schools that are underrepresented and increase that number from two to maybe four or five students from underrepresented schools to try to give them that opportunity, get them in the summer program, uh, work with them, try to get the scores up. Let's try to increase the numbers because if what's working now, if what we're doing now is only producing 3% African Americans out of 50%, we have something, there's a flaw somewhere we need to address. So I'm thinking this would be a big help if we can increase those numbers. If, if this works the way I as an educator think it might work, we would have some precedent for future decisions that I will bring to the board. Right, so, so right now we're fixing the 2018-2019 school year, right? Yes, yes, sir. So, so that would be my recommendation. That we would change it from two to five and let it affect those kids that are at a schools that are where they're underrepresented. Madam Chair, then there's a motion on the floor. Um, if Reverend Collins wants to make a motion yes. to be voted on after that. No, I can, make a, I can make a new motion. Right, make another motion and get another second. We can vote on that as well. But mine takes precedence. All right, so Reverend Collins, so, do you want to make a motion? Yes. All right, the motion uh, is? Uh, I move to uh, approve, the, approve the motion, but change the word, not for, change number two to five. So Scratch you want the, the five highest five. ranking students in each Charleston County School District eighth grade program to apply for admission. That's what the words say if you change it from two to, two to five. five. All right, so you want to change But that's five from five. every middle school, Reverend Collins. Well, we will, uh, we, but, and we will give the superintendent discretion that she can see where the kids are really applying for I, I, I don't, Well, personally, I don't think that, we, that, that when we give 
when you say that we're going to give the superintendent that discretion, that's not fair to her because it's in favor of the identify the schools where kids aren't really applying at. And not really, uh, well, let me just say this. Maybe, maybe it's a better way to word I don't know. But. Let me just say this. I know that Judith is working on a number of ideas to it really get what Allie just said. elementary and then middle school kids prepared. And I think we'd be better served by keeping the two as it is and let her see how that goes and let us all see how that's implemented. And then she, <coughs> or she has a wealth. But, and, and, and I understand did. that, but Reverend but, but Collins hold on, hold on, has a right to make a motion. Right. He just needs yeah. to create the motion. It can't right. be we're going to do this, but have her do that. Right. Create right. a motion, right. Reverend Collins. So, uh, my recommendation is that we approve this motion, but change number two to five from the, for two to five students. Okay, so Reverend Collins has made a motion, and he just and I need you to read that motion as it would read entirely. It's so right, we're not right saying we're agenda. just changing. Right. The board will consider extending an invitation to the top five highest ranking students in each Charleston County School District 8th grade program to apply for admission to Academic Magnet High School for the 18-19 school year with the understanding that they must meet the admissions criteria of scoring 13.0 or higher on the current rubric. Do I need to read that? Well, one? does it mean the top five students score? And he needs to be very clear in his motion. So the second sentence right there would be the top. Now it says now five. only the top two that score below thirteen. I'm so asking. That's, that's how that's how he's made his motion. Reverend Collins, you need to say an exact motion because the way you say it just says five get invited to apply, but only and two. All right. The no. second sentence is then the top five students scoring 12.0 to 12.99 who attend and successfully <coughs> complete a series of summer, spring and summer workshops designed to strengthen academic skills to prepare a plan for successful matriculation at Academic Magnet High School will be accepted into AMHS for the 18-19 school year. I, I think that's fair. And I can, I can be honest, I can use four, number four or number five, either one. Well, what do you, what's your motion? This is a four, four. Okay, the motion is four in both places. Yes, four. So the top four students who score between 12 and 12.99 in yep. every middle school yep. automatically get in. So Mr. River Collins has blind. a motion. Do we have a second? I have a question. We have a question. We need a second yep. to now, discuss. We have a second to, to discuss it. I have a question. Oh, have to, we have to have a second to discuss it. All right, what's your question? Okay. My question is, Reverend Collins, you made, while you were making your statement, <coughs> you said that you wanted to identify um, certain schools. Yes. So based on that statement, I believe, I'm not an attorney, but I believe that would go against <laughs> it got what, Natalie out of her chair. <laughs> what, 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 what Natalie said earlier about the consistency being across mm -hmm. the board. That's correct. I sat back down when um, Chairperson Darby read the new motion because right. it indicated that this would apply to everybody. So the top five right. kids at Lang are getting in yeah. if they score yeah. 12. The top five kids at Moultrie are getting in if they score 12. The top five kids at yeah. Right. Say James Santee are getting right. in every right. single school. And, it, and then also, that would then, based on the presentation that Judith gave us last week at Baptist Hill High School, we, with the two students, there's a budgetary impact, the estimated total cost not to exceed $7,000. That included the four teachers at, you know, whatever, and the four teachers at another amount, plus materials. So to increase two and a half, because your number, two and a half times we would have to do two and a half times that number. Um, <laughs> And then it would also include. But we'd also have to consider, does that mean that we're adding that many extra seats? Because what it was is they were adding those extra seats and they were taking from right. the 640 yeah. max. Uh -huh. Okay, so we right. don't have a second right now on that. So Reverend Collins' motion is about to die. So yeah. but Cindy's motion, um, the top two. And we have a second. Who seconded that? Michael, Michael. Well, let me. Can I? I want. I want to say this. I. I understand the. The importance of. Diversifying, <coughs> and providing something. Jarita mentioned earlier about equity, across our district when it comes to opportunities in our schools. Um, I'll have to push back on Judith this a little bit. Because you said over the last 10 years, there hadn't been a problem with the process. But we've got less than 15 kids of African-American descent on the campus. So I do think there is a problem with a process. I, not the right. But, but so, we, so to, 
I think this is an attempt for us in our own way to try to address the concerns of the lack of diversity on that campus and the lack of opportunities that certain students may have based on the schools that they attend. Cindy mentioned earlier there are certain middle schools that have a lot of students who get an opportunity to attend Academic Magnet because of the offerings at that school, because of the scores that they take, the, the writing samples, and so on and so forth. So I, although I agree and like the ambition of Reverend Collins' point to try to increase diversity at Academic Magnet, I don't want us to, and I, I still think we're still, through some of Cindy's commentary, I think we're still working through and vetting this process um, to make sure that it's fair um, for all, obviously having Natalie um, um, talk about the consistency throughout the district, making sure we're not sliding anyone, leaving ourselves open to um, legal actions by parents who may feel their you child. You getting the email right. from the number four kid um, <laughs> who didn't get in because she was a girl because the boys got in. Right. I mean, and we just and, have to and so I do have a couple of questions for Judith before we have our vote, if it's okay. I wanted to know, do you know how many African American students were added to the enrollment of Academic Magnet based on the top two that we did last year? Nine. Nine? That was last year. For, for how many applied? Is, is that everybody that applied, or how many? The other question would be: Is how many African American students applied based on the top two? Oh yeah, yeah. Those, those, those questions are coming. Right, hold on, let Michael. Or Michael, are these questions we need answered tonight, or well, did you put them? In well, I, I think what it does is it puts in context mm -hmm. where we're trying to go and where Reverend Collins wants us to go. Okay, go keep asking. Then. So there's nine students from all of the middle schools in our district. Um, so nine, the two. nine African American from the top two. So that brought the total number of African Americans on the mili on Academic Magnus campus currently to. What's the total number of, of African American I, students I, at Military Mag at Academic Magnus now? Ninth grade. Well, she she answered the top two was nine. So you'd have to get that number. You'd have right. to get that number. Same. I, yeah. Okay. Do you do you know just off offhand? Do you know how those nine students are doing academically now? They're doing very well. I got their report cards. Uh, as 10th graders, and they're all doing well. Okay. Now, those, those nine students, we didn't have in place the summer enrichment program for those students, correct? Right. So the, and so to Cindy's point, the question then would become, of all of the students who gained entrance into academic magnet based on the top two, do you know how many of those students total we had, and how many of those total students were African American? I don't, I don't know that um, because there were some top two from uh, that came in because they were on the waiting list and they were students, uh, they were white students. Mm -hmm. um, the, the nine came from um, a persistent look for the top two students okay. um, in schools and getting uh, the marginalized schools, the schools that had not been sending students. Okay. We went very specifically <laughs> to those schools to talk with those parents and to get those children. Okay, all right. How many got excluded because of that 12 or whatever? Okay. Do, do you know how many students may have gotten excluded because of the 12, the, the score 12 or, or low, lower? The 12 to 12.99. 12 right. Right, right, right. Do right. You, you don't know? See, I think those no, are the kind of material. See, I think those are the kind of material kind of numbers we need. I think, you know, Chris's direction is audacious. I mean, I think we, we see the need to have more diversity on campus. Um, but at the same time, we're looking at how we have currently in place, how's that working, making sure that not only the students get in but are supported while they're there, not only supported while they're there, but do well while they're, they're in the building. Right. They graduate, that they move on. So um, <laughs> Reverend Collins, unfortunately, I will not support your, your motion, but I do understand and support the vein in which it was made. Ke Kevin and then Reverend Collins. Well, again, Michael, you echoed everything I wanted to say. But let me just say, um, I hope, you know, we're going to be doing a study soon with the gentleman that's coming in to evaluate diversity and throughout our district. That is something we need to have a second set of eyes look at. We're not going to solve this problem overnight. What happened there didn't happen overnight. Right. We all agree that there needs to be a change there. Um, but just solving it in one meeting is not going to take that. It's going to take a comprehensive study.
comprehensive efforts okay. to be able to integrate that system and to make it more diverse. Yeah. So again, you know, I applaud Chris for what he's trying to do. Um, I just don't agree with that motion because I think it creates more of a problem than it does a solution. Um, more teachers of African American in that institution to make more African Americans more comfortable attending there. Um, principals, uh, just groundwork overall, and parents, you know, wanting. And Chris Stobbs said parents and students are wanting diversity. We have to all work together to kind of make that happen. Yeah. So it's just going to take everybody together as a team to make that an accomplishment. That's all. All right, Reverend Collins and then Cindy. <coughs> I have a question for you also, if you want to come up. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that you guys understand that unless the board gives special concessions and meet again to discuss the admissions process academic magnet, that there's no more change until, until next year. This is our final opportunity. Unless we're, unless we're able to go into November to make some kind of changes. And so without the two top students, <coughs> the percentage of African-American students attending Academic Magnet High School, probably looking like 2.2 point something percent, maybe 2.5, 2.1%. So 3.3% so of nine because of the results of last year's initiative, we're still in pretty uh, bad shape. Mm -hmm. And so we, we need something to be done that's gonna increase those numbers for this upcoming year. That we, that, that we can see that it's a tangible, fair process for all students. And, uh, and like, it is hard to get it done tonight. Everyone's tired. Don't feel like discussing it much further. We spent so much time on the other issues. And it is hard to get it done in a meeting like this. And we probably still need to come back before kids start applying to your school. Because we, need, we just have something that's going to increase that number higher than 3%. So to me, it's just not acceptable. But uh, so obviously my question is to uh, Ms. Haim is, uh, if we were to identify all the under, all underrepresented schools, all under, all the underrepresented schools, and give those kids the opportunity to apply, you know, top two, three, four, whatever we choose, is that legal? If they're doing underrepresented schools, it's not legal. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm trying to rephrase it. What you understand? Yes, but, he's saying, is it minute, legal if minute, we said minute, minute, let, let, me, let me say this. If we, if, we address, if we identify all of our underrepresented schools, but kids don't hardly apply for them to go to academic high school, let's say it's seven schools, for example. We identify the seven schools by that title as underrepresented. And, and so gave, and gave, three, gave three or four or five of those, the top three or four or five students in those schools the opportunity to apply. Is that legal or illegal to do that? If we're using the top schools, the top underrepresented schools, underrepresented schools in Charleston County. Well, that on its face, it's illegal. All right. I will look into it further and get you a more detailed explanation mm -hmm. as to the intricacies of it. But on its face, the way that you're saying it is illegal. Right. All right. So what would be the legal way to say it? She said she'd look into it. She can't. So, so I want us. I want, that's what I want us to work on that. And and when when you when when the kids apply, when does it apply? Is it November or December uh, to go to your school, like the back to high school? When when does when does the admission begin? The application process begin? January tenth. So then we could meet again then. Right, that's good. Reverend Collins, we had a whole workshop on this. Well, in, but she didn't have to finish the but workshop. But you need though. to come back with something specific All that right. you want to do. And do it that's, that's fine. I'll stop here. I'll stop here. Okay. I don't get Chris too tired. All right. Now, so number we one, Chris, we need to be making decisions. I don't know why we spend seven hours in a committee meeting for Chris Collins to come here and ask for 30 percent of the items to be pulled because he's not getting what he be believes to be his vote. I say we scrap the committee of the whole process if we're going to do this. Okay, so what now, my other question that? is, I'll be in favor of that. why is this board? <laughs> Thank you. So, so what I want to hear is an equal commitment from this board to diversify Garrett. Not one word was said about not spending extra money. Let's not build the CAS in West Ashley and let's pull from a thoroughly diverse community. And if you want to put the CAS at Garrett, don't build one in District 10 and have it be where a multitude of diverse students come. The, if you want to put this much energy in diversifying schools, put this much energy into diversifying schools or just admit you just want more African-American children in certain schools. All right. 
Who's um, the, who's the underserved population in this I district? Mean, I mean, if we want to, I mean, we want to have, we don't want to have that conversation right now. I'm about to say, because I'll, I'll go down that road if that's, that's the road we're going down. That <laughs> I'll go. I'll, I'm, I'm ready to have that conversation. Yeah. All right, it's not, or Mr. Stop. All right, I got a couple of comments. Currently, to be competitive, um, the students, not in the top two thing, but you have to score 14.25 or above. You're basically, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the solution is to better prepare the kids from K forward so that they can compete on an, e on an equal footing with everybody, not create a, a, a false um, floor for these kids. I think that's unfair to the kids, and I think that we, and I, I think it's a band-aid for us, and it makes us lazy. We really need to be fixing the problem from K to eight, not apply. trying to just put a band-aid on it at this level to lower the lo lower the admissions. I, I actually find that kind of offensive. Uh, the, Top two admissions, just to make it clear, that's um, seats in addition to the, the normal admissions, if, if I'm correct. Yeah. All right. Um, are we including the charter schools, the private schools, the magnets, the home schools? Last year there was confusion about that. Are we, con are we including our charter schools? I, you know, I mean, that's, and is that something that the group wants? Next, um, you know, we have an issue with, um, you know, the diversity issue. You know, we, you know, we, we, we look at the academic, or we look at the um, African American situation, academic magnet, but there's a lot of diversity there that's not African American. This is probably, I think it's eight or nine percent of the Asian students there. So, Hispanic it's, is also and the Hispanic most rapidly and, growing and minority Charles group. Has the floor. Right, and there, and and recently, and I, I mentioned this at the committee of the whole that you know there was an issue where we had some foreign exchange students that they've been told that they can't come back, and that's, um, you know, that's upset the students so what little diversity there is there the the, the um, kids have been told well we're going to get rid of a lot of those kids and I think that's kind of unfair and then you know I do want the people up here to realize that what we're saying here in that vote if you read it carefully it says you know no longer do the kids that are top two score in a 13 to 15 are getting in you're, you you got to be pegged in that 12 to 12.99 so if you're a, a top two kid and you score a 14 Tough, you're out. You better score because that's basically no, just for the it, 12 to 9, 12. No, it nine. says that if they score 12 to 12.99, they have to attend workshops. Yep. It's silent on what happens if they score a 13. They don't have to attend the workshop. Silent. No. Yep. I'm sorry, it's my understanding, and Judith can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's if the top two, if one of them doesn't make it, they have to attend the workshop. So if one of the top two students scores a 12.5, They'll just be given the extra support. Or both of them. But if they score a 13, they get in. They score the 13. Without having to go to the special that's programming. Who get the another two kids right. between 12 right. and 12.9. I, 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 I do think it would be helpful if we knew like how many kids actually fell into this little thing and what what problem are we solving? So, so yeah, I'd like to know that too. That yeah, I mean, information for us in our next Friday update of how many kids who applied we're top two fell in that category. I think y'all looked at that. I okay. think this is just a feel good solution to something that we don't know what we're solving. And unfortunately, I think it's a band aid for a, a much larger problem. And it's going to make us not do our job, which is to fix K through eight. Well, it's easy. It's a, I agree with Chris. I think right. it's an easier fix it? than to have to do okay. We have a motion on the floor. We have a motion on the floor. And I just want to say, I think this is a step. It's not anything. Yeah. All right. Mr. Hollinshed, how do you All right. Yes? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Yes. Uh, Ms. Coates. Yes. Reverend Collins. I vote yes. Uh, Mr. Miller. Aye. Mr. Stobbs. No. And I vote yes, and the motion passes. Wait. I'm going to vote no to put a band aid on it. I'm going to vote no. I, I, okay, I'm just going to, I just, you, you are certainly welcome to your vote, but I don't understand why you vote against something. I'm going to tell you why, because. I we're not we're not getting much improvements from this process no, we're using. You're making some. No, no, no. Okay. Not, 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 not when the largest group of people are the least amount in attendance at a school. Something's wrong. Something's drastically wrong with that picture. All right. The next item on the agenda is the certification no, of delegates the for the 2017 That's School discussion. Boards Association um, Assembly. And I think we were uh, motion was for Matt Coates and Hollister. Sure. Yeah, Mrs. Co Mrs. Uh, was it Mrs. Coates, Reverend Mack, and Mr. Hollister? Move to approve. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Second. And it's for the three who we just said, right? Reverend Mack, Ms. Coates, and, and, and Mr. And Hollister. Kevin's a alternate. Okay, and Mr. Hollister's alternate. That's right. Yeah. Okay. All right, so we have a motion and a second. Do we have a second? I'll second. I seconded it. Uh, Mr. Hollinshed, how do you vote? Yes. 
Ms. Cope? Yes. Reverend Collins? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, Mr. Miller? Aye. Mr. Strauss? Yes. And I vote yes. The motion passes. Um, the next item is, oh, I'm sorry, I was not on the right page to see that that was in print. My bad. Um, second reading of policies. Um, Cindy, do you have any? These were all approved by the board at first reading at the July board meeting. They're being presented for second reading. Okay. Because they were approved for fir by first reading, they don't go through the committee again. The woman that approved? July. July what? 19 or 24th? Seven, 17th. I couldn't remember the date of the meeting. So it's policy, so, and you have been. So, so hold on a minute. Does not have to face second reading within 60 days? No, we took that away a long time ago. We changed that policy. What's the rule, what's the rule now? There is no second rule. reading. Hmm? They have a second reading at a board meeting. No, no certain amount of time? No. No certain amount of time. Okay, we need to fix that. That's not good. Well, we changed that. Well, you we voted for it. We want to get revoted. So, Cindy, do, do you have a motion to Yeah, I move to approve second reading. Um, I've, I've gone through them, and I've gone through the minutes, and nothing that was discussed in the minutes was left out of the second reading. Okay, so we have a motion to have a second. Do have a second? The policies. Second, second reading of the policies. You're doing all of that. Chris, like, I'm sorry. I, I have a... All right, can I have a second? So I second it. All right, sorry, yeah. Kevin. All right, Ms. Miller. I just have a question on policy GBEA. Uh -huh. Has been revised to clearly address romantic and intimate relationships between supervisors and those who directly or indirectly report to them. How do you prove that? Um, I mean, I, I think, I mean, I'll Bill, you want to answer it the same way you answered it in July when he asked you that question in July? <laughs> Please do, because I obviously don't remember. It probably didn't make sense then. It probably won't make sense today either. Well, it happens a number of ways, and maybe the employees um, have a concern that they share with employee relations. Or, you know, they have a concern that they share with the employee that's maybe involved in the relationship besides the sexual harassment that comes forward. So it, it would depend on the circumstances. I, I mean, so it would depend on one of the persons within the relationship to address it and make it known? No, you don't require just self-identification. In a lot of these cases, if you've got that, somebody working in that work group is going to note that there's this unique relationship between their peer and their supervisor, and that's a lot of the ways that this becomes an issue and addressed. In my, in my, just in my background with HR, if, there, if that is happening, people know about it. And, and if, if yeah, you're, but, I mean, if, you but if we're all teachers and one of, know. yeah, there, it, this day and, age, it's easy to and, and Michael, I assure you, I know that you have tend to have a small number of employees that are yeah. very similar. I assure you, this is a policy we need when you got 5,000. Well, I'm not saying we need the policy. I'm just asking and, how and, you prove and the way it's written is pretty standard for all okay. industries. All right. Um, Reverend Collins, do you have a question? So Mr. Brigman, uh, The, 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 the criminal background check uh, in place, that's the NCIC? Is that, is that, what you're, is that the background check you're speaking about? Is that the background check you're speaking about? Background check. What? The, policy. the next one is policy uh, GDCFB, the clearance, uh, st clearance standards. We worked on it a little bit, uh, me and the attorney. company by the name of Bib, and I'm having. Bib. <laughs> Background information business. That's actually. I, I know, like, for, I'm mean, used for example. Uh, I had to go. I had to go on Air Force Base to, to do some appliance work for, for for a customer that lived on base, and I had to go through a background check just mm -hmm. to get in. Did you pass? No, just I wasn't good enough. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but but they, but they checked me out thoroughly, uh, pulled up some information, mm -hmm. and then also uh, when I was uh, in, when I was dealing with Department of Services in the in the foster in the foster care program, I had to, I, had to get, I got fingerprinted and a background check, and then I, and, the, and the police. At the, in fact, at the police at the police station one time. So so what so what is what is what are the police departments using? And what is the federal government using for their background checks? What are they using? I don't know the answer to what they use. Yeah. Because it's supposed to be over. Okay. company we contract with. And right. And we discussed this, I guess, back in July. The concerns you had. Well. Yeah, yeah. Back in what you were allowed to do. Natalie addressed them. Right. Yeah, just last month. We were pulling as much data as we're allowed to by state law. We 
I know you are, and you have that in the policy. I see that you did a good job on that. But what I'm asking you now is, when a person when a really wants to know what's in your background, like like the federal government or some other agency, probably is just going to look at hiring you. <coughs> what are they using? Are they they can go back ten years Madam or better. Madam Chair, I'm not sure that our staff is required to know what other government entities yeah. use for years background checks. Thank you. Appreciate that. This way, I'm almost done. What I'm asking is, because of the limits on certain states. When you come across that, that said maybe a state don't want to give you four years or five years, is there a way you still can use what the federal government use or some other agency use or, or the military use to get more information that would, go, that would go beyond that? Is there a way you can get around the state law? <coughs> no, but please stop interfering. No, so, but Bill, when you all do background checks, I'm assuming there are times that, you, that things come up so you don't hire people, right? Right, so yes, yeah, so, so for the states that don't want to give, more years or something. That's what I'm really getting at. There has to be a way you can find out what somebody did eight or nine years ago. There still must, there still must be a way. We're not closing the door on that, are we? Well, we're pulling whatever bids will pull for us. Whatever the company would pull, I have no other way. So bid was allowed to pull. I'm sure, have, I'm sure they're not limited to what they can pull. All right. So that, I just want to make sure we were that we weren't closing the door on that opportunity. Right. Yeah, they okay. do know that, but I want to make sure that nobody misunderstands this. This policy is written so that we will pull as far back as that state law allows us, and we are not going to usurp that state law to get a background check. So you may hire somebody who has a shorter history background than someone else from another state that has a longer one, and I don't want them beating up the district when that happens next year. But well, wait a minute. That, that's really part of what I'm getting at. But Cindy just said, when, it, when that state law would only give you a certain amount of years, you still have federal agencies you can go through to get information. Mm -hmm. And then if there's something in that person's background that's detrimental, <laughs> or put children at risk, or faculty at risk, that we need to know. So, so we, don't, we don't want to say that so, so right, they can't go further. Right. We contract with the company called BIB. Bid. BIB. And I'm sure that Bill would be happy to let you know kind of okay. what they do. But All we right. only but he did a good, But he did a good job in general. Right. But having some experience with the federal background checks, because that's what yes. some so of my But we're not saying does. we can't get other information. The they are not going that. to do that for oh, a local work entity. Like yeah. Yeah. Background checks don't work like that. Right. I'm not going to rep okay. the teachers. All right. So can we can have a vote on this item? I have, I have yep. a question. Ms. Um, no, sorry. Ms. Nally, did you ever get any information on whether or not we can offer or should offer or have the ability to do drug tests before we hire? Pre-employment? Yeah. Yes. We are in the process of collecting that information. Okay. We are claiming, I believe, that our <coughs> For okay. November. Okay. 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 All right. Can we vote now? Mr. Hollinshed? All right. Ms. Coates? Yes. Robin Collins? Yes. Mr. Miller? Uh, aye. 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 I'm sorry. Can you think of that? No. Aye. Mr. Thobbs? Sure. Can I vote yes? The motion <laughs> passes. Um, the next item is... Fixed cost of ownership for FY18, I move to approve. Okay, so we have a motion to approve. Do we where have are we? Where second? are we? Um, oh. This is 9.38. Yeah, 9.38. And this is approving the fixed cost of operation FY18 software reallocation. Is this the Promethean stuff? Arch reallocation. I'm sorry. Arch reallocation. Arch reallocation. It's nothing to do with boards. <laughs> It's a reallocation to provide instruments for the strings program. The instruments for the strings program. Right, we talked about yeah. this at the Committee of the Whole for quite a long time. So do I have a motion? I made the motion. Second. You need a second. Okay, second. second. All right, Mr. Hollinshed? All right. Ms. Coates? Yes. Reverend Collins? Yes. Mr. Miller? Aye. Yes. Mr. Staubs, and I vote yes. All right. So the next item is... Capital maintenance reallocation. Move to approve. Okay, so we have a motion. We have a second. 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 Okay, we have a, two seconds. Do you have any questions? All right, uh, Mr. Hollinshed. All right. Ms. Coates. Yes. Reverend Collins. Yes. Mr. Miller. Aye. Mr. Shaw. Yes. 
And I vote yes. And our next item is the capital mm -hmm. maintenance plan. Make a motion for the approval. All right, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Yes, second. Second from Cindy. Question. Okay. Um, Mr. Hollinshed? I have a question. Oh, sorry, sorry, I'm sorry. Is there a savings here? Mr. Burley, is there a savings? No, sir. This is an annual update to the plan of where we're going to spend our money. Okay. For the remaining years. Every year we return you with an update right. to the plan, taking off the projects that we've done, mm -hmm. showing that it's complete, re racking and stacking the deck and coming back forward. Okay. Um, have you already identified um, potential um, companies to do the work since, yes, we're, since we're restacking? I mean, some go off, and so we still have to bid out. The, Correct. Okay. All right. The project that we bid out is going to come off. Gotcha. For execution. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I got that question answered? Yeah. Okay. Um, Mr. Hollinshed? Um, Reverend Collins? No. Okay, Mr. Miller? Aye. Yes. Mr. Stobbs? And I vote yes, so the motion passes. Um, Mrs. Jarvie? Yes. I'm sorry. For the record, um, on item 9.4, the bond resolution, the general obligation bonds for the tax anticipation note, for the record, that was approved when the board approved the agenda, agenda yeah, right. under consent. Mm -hmm. Correct? Yes. That, that is correct. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, wait, wait. <laughs> make sure. We still got the uh, board members' oh, yeah, yeah. attendance. Come on. We've got two. two we've got a request for Mr. Hollinshed to. Yes. I've got, I've got it. Okay. Right. For sure. So the next item is we have two travel requests. I make a motion that we group items 9.5B and C together. Move okay. to approve. And, all right. So we can do it in a second. I have one of this. Hmm? That's one question. You said B and C or A and B? B and C. B and C. Right. Travel and C, what? Which are the two travel requests, two which travel. we just right, have right, you right, on right. there. Right, right, right. What do you mean? Right. I'm just giving yeah, this is a number. But I, what I'm asking is when we, uh, sometimes the cost is not quite the same. Right. Like if I think you might go there to the, the, stage, the day before for that morning. I just want to make sure we can capture that. Yeah, this is a, just a draft of a. Right, that we're not agreeing, not voting to the exact dollar. Yeah. No. Right. And, all, and also while we're on the floor, because you can see I'm pretty small, but uh, sometimes on the airplane. No, you do not get two seats. A, no, I don't want two seats, but sometimes a larger seat or a, or a first class. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Yeah, I think maybe looking for, now that we're Exit so window. Early, you yeah. can look on that, that first yeah, row. Either, so yeah, either a larger seat or either first okay. class. Exit we can window. First class. But maybe sometimes if you get early enough, it's, it's, Are you it's a good part. No, I don't think <laughs> but sometimes that's what Did you just ask for a okay. first class ticket? Yeah, no, well, I'm just saying, a, a larger seat or first class, what I'm saying. Mr. Hollinshed. Yeah. Well, larger or first class. I think yes. train. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Reverend Collins. Yes, yes. Um, this is for regular. This is for regular for, coach, right. steerage, no, whatever. No, or no, train. No, whatever needed. The difference, I'll pay well, the difference. Mr. Miller, whatever needed. Or, you know, the bulkhead seat where you get lots of room. <laughs> Mr. Miller. That's where I like to sit. No, like oh, your, yeah. your leg room, not with. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Stobbs. Mm -hmm. As long as it's the regular kind of seat. Regular, so. Okay, and I vote yes, and the motion no, no passes. No private jet. Uh, but I, I, I want to say this for you. Work? Okay, hold on a minute. But, but I want to tell you this. Uh, no. Of course, you did a good job the last time. Very good job getting my seats and stuff. But but one of the seats I had was right up against the wall, and the wall curved right over my seat. So my suggestion. And I had to ride sideways. Uh, I, I, I had to ride sideways like this. I, could, I couldn't believe it. Well, should talk <laughs> so, the they should have yeah. went up so, way so, so, high. Wait a minute. I've been seeing Knock you out. So what, what, I'm, what I'm asking is that. Open the door. <laughs> We're doing this may, way earlier this year. So but I have one more question, though. Uh, okay. Seriously. Yeah. So, so at the so at the last board meeting, when we voted for the traveling, myself, Mike, and Priscilla, how did that? At the school, we voted for the travel. You guys remember that? No, we were, for the we, national school board travel. We, we, so vote, we did, but that was not on the agenda. You had something else on the agenda. So yeah, that was for, for Denver. For the we're, so we're just clarifying that we're agreeing for you to go to the national school board. Uh, first, he wants to okay, first Mr. Collin Shea. Hey, I first just want, I just want to say for the record, um, Dr. Postlewitz, along with Erica, um, Joe, and Cindy Ambrose, um, came out for the Burke Parade last week, 
uh, Dr. Posowitz uh, recognized my alma mater, band directors, Benedict College. But the band directors are from Charleston County. They are graduates of Lincoln High School and Burke High School. Um, their band is widely recognized throughout the Southeast now and has performed in one of the very prestigious Honda Battle of the Bands. But well, I had a good time with Ms. Ambrose and Joe riding the parade. But one of the things I also want to say a thank you to was to the principal, uh, William Brennan, um, and Dr. Postowitz, one, for recognizing them and honoring them, and two, for Mr. Runyon. Mr. Runyon welcomed them into the school and made sure that they uh, got to the game and they performed magnificently well. But the thing that struck me, um, I stayed around afterwards. I was an old man and should have been home in bed, mm -hmm. but I stayed with the band members as they ate their meal, and they recognized Mr. Runyon, and Mr. Runyon gave a compelling speech about education to them. About seven or eight students in the band were educational members. And he welcomed them to apply to Charleston County. So therefore, the little outreach that we do, look what it yielded. And students are not interested in the district. So again, I um, had to go out to Dr. Postowitz and Mr. Runyon uh, because, you know, we're an extension of each other and they both did a great job on that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other items for tonight? Thank you to you all for sticking in with us till um, nice. almost 9 o'clock, and I'm sure you all were here about Thank four hours earlier than I got. Yeah, really. Place, so. First um, class. Meeting adjourned. Thank you. Mm -hmm.